Yeah, imagine living like a black man. Yeah. In the center, we've sought to improve credit, increase savings, reduce debt, and increase the use of financial products that put people on a path to wealth building and financial stability. Throughout this time, the center has done free programming in the virtual space over the last four months. We've done over 100 programs and worked with over 1,000 people. I do daily programming, and we're very proud of the team that we've created. So Brian um, got together a while back. He said, man, we got to do something about this and the times we find ourselves in. Um, so Brian and I established a partnership to make sure there was a safe place and a safe space to communicate on what's going on in America right now with the backdrop of COVID-19 and the police brutality. So without further ado, I'm turning the program over to Brian and I'll be admitting people into the room. And every now and then, Brian, if we could revisit sort of groundkeeping, housekeeping rules, um, that would be perfect. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you, Heath. Uh, what I'm so excited about is every single panelist that's online today are personal friends of mine. These are not people that I went after because of their expertise or their, what they do or their big name. Although they have those big names, although they do have that expertise, we have respect a mutual admiration and, and a really grounded relationship. And for you guys to volunteer, no one's getting paid today, right? Which they could be and they do all the time across the country in a variety of lanes. But for you guys to come on today and to pour back into the students of Prince George's, to pour back into our participants, on behalf of DMSI, my program, uh, the Diverse Male Student Initiative program, I am, I am indebted to you. I thank you. The, the first one we had was amazing. I'm thinking this one's going to be even better. What I would say is this, let's, again, re uh, repeating what he said, let's make sure we're active in the chat, resources in the chat, make sure you're keeping the conversation going, and, and really beyond that, let's have a good time and let's share some information. Uh, with that being said, I wanted to pick up and kind of start off today's Zoom experience with an update of the, the cases that we started off with a couple weeks ago which was the George Floyd, the Ahmaud Arbery, and the Breonna Taylor. If you really, really think about it, we know as people of color and just aware people, these have not been the only individuals uh, killed by police officers, but it was their cases back to back that woke up the consciousness of the world. So with that being said, I want to kick things off to a good friend of mine, a college alumni, buddy, this is my guy. He's come to the college and spoke before. He's run for political office. His name is Brian Taylor with B. Taylor Productions. He's going to give us an overview of those three open cases, and let's get up to speed with where these cases are. Brian. Thank you, sir. I'd like to say hello to everyone, and, uh, and what an honor it is to be here today to be a part of this panel. So I want to thank you all for having me, and I appreciate all your input, and I look forward to listening to, learning from you, and also sharing whatever I can to help the conversation move forward. Again, my name is Brian Taylor, and I wanted to give an update on the cases that we've all been seeing in the news as of late. Uh, the first one I want to start out with is Brianna Taylor. Uh, Detective Brent Haskins, a police officer involved in the fatal shooting of Brianna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, has been fired for more than three months after Taylor's death. At least three different law enforcement agencies in the state have launched panel, excuse me, parallel investigations into Taylor's death. The officers involved remain on administrative assignments uh, Taylor's, as Taylor's family uh, struggles to move on. This particular case, uh, as you all know, has been, has been in the news, back in the news, because again, this happened a, a little while back. And it's one of those things that has lost the conversation and the no-not warrants that, that we're talking about in great detail today. And you have to wonder, uh, and it's just my commentary here, you have to wonder as a Black person, when are we ever safe? You know, uh, the woman was in her own home, uh, sleeping in her own bed, minding her own business, and, and now she's a victim of, of, of police violence. And so it's just the question you got to ask yourself as a Black person in this country, when are we ever safe? Uh, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, three white men accused of killing Ahmaud Arbery, a Black man who was shot dead after being chased in South Georgia neighborhood, has been indicted uh, on murder charges in Georgia grand jury. Uh, the men, Greg McMichael, 64, his son, Travis McMichael, 34, and their neighbor, William Bryan, 50, were arrested and charged last month with murder 
and other three and, and other crimes in a connection with uh, Aubrey's death. The murder prompted nationwide protests and indignation after the graphic video was released online in the February 23rd killing. Again, a man running and doing uh, jogging in, in the afternoon, and now he's dead. So again, where, when are we ever safe in this country? And last but not least, George Floyd. Um, Mr. Floyd gasping death immortalized by a bystander cell phone video during the twilight hours of Memorial Day caused over two weeks of sprawling protests across the world against police brutality. Derek Chauvin, uh, the former Minneapolis police officer, was charged with murdering George Floyd. Four, four officers were charged overall. Four officers were released on bail and two remain in custody. The only thing I can say about that is why are they out on bail? Why did it even receive bail? You know, Black people in this country uh, are, are never usually receive bail for such such a heinous crime. Uh, we're, we're in a situation in this country today where if the tables were turned and a black person had killed a cop, I mean, th there's no question of where they will be right now. There's no question where the charges will be right now. There's no question of what the outcry from the police community would be right now. And so we have to look at all these instances and there's several more, there's countless more, there's way too many more. We have to look at all of them out where we where we stand in this country the marches are great and i i i, I applaud the brothers and sisters that are in the streets marching but we have to figure out other other ways we can be impactful in our own community and stop waiting on other people to do it for us we got to come together on our own with our with our youth with our young people even with our adults and our senior citizens we can't leave anybody out but we got to start looking within our own selves enough intelligence enough brilliance there's enough money in our own communities to do for ourselves and stop looking for them to do it for us. We've been here for one or some years and they haven't done it yet. What in the world, what in the world makes us think they're gonna do it now? You're muted. Uh, quick question. Yes. What, one of the things that you spoke to, and I think it's very important, I want people to come in the chat or ask questions, uh, but we're gonna do it very concisely. We get very excited about these protests and you spoke to it. We get very right. excited about these arrests taking place. But then right. what tends to happen is our attention span gets distracted and we don't realize the judicial system never convicts these police officers. And what right. ends up happening is we think we've had justice because they got arrested, but then they're never convicted. Looking at the cases you reviewed, what's your personal reflection for what you've noticed about these three cases and what would you like to see moving forward? Well, one thing people got to understand that everything's a process. You know, it's not, it's not just an arrest. It's not just an indictment. There is a long legal process that, that before there's a conviction or an acquittal. Uh, as for these three cases, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, there's a lot of gray area in all these three cases. Uh, you look at, you look at Brianna. I mean, the naked eye would say it's an open and shut case, but from the police perspective, they had a legal warrant. Uh, they can argue that uh, they got bad information on the address, which is not their fault. They could argue that, uh, you know, they were executing a warrant, a just warrant, and they received fire coming in the door. So if, 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 it, if they're in the mindset of this a justified warrant, a legally justified warrant, no not warrant, you, you come into this home, you receive fire, you're going to return fire. Now we can talk about the excessive nature of the fire, but that's their, that's their case right there, you know? And so that's very great. That's extremely great. And the first autopsy report was, was ridiculous, but it even said that she wasn't even uh, brutalized. It didn't even, it didn't even account for, for the, for the gunshot wounds that she, that she uh, uh, had. And now Amon Aubrey's case, I think is a little bit more black and white. Uh, because their defense was almost uh, it was almost a, a um, citizen's arrest kind, uh, but it wasn't justified by anything that the man had done. It was their suspicion of the man, uh, and so and you can't they can't they can't fall back on the on the mindset of imminent threat because the man didn't have a gun and they did have a gun, and so I think that opportunity for conviction is is higher than than the Brianna case. Now, for the George Floyd. I think the biggest the biggest hurdle in the George Floyd in the George Floyd case is the fact that 
they're going to argue, in my opinion, that there was resistance. Now, the video shows different. But from my understanding, there's a block of time where there is no video. Uh, we see him on the curb in the, in the beginning of the video. I think we've all seen that video. Um, and the thing that I see where it's him on the ground. And so from, from what I understand, there's a block of time. There is no video. I think they're going to they're going to try to justify resistance and justify the, 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 the knee and the neck. Will that fly? I don't know. I know it's very hard uh, to convict uh, police officers in these situations, largely due to the fact a public opinion about police officers. We have our opinion about police officers because of our experience. But when you look at a jury pool and you talk about being uh, a jury pool of your peers, you're going to have a diverse jury pool. And, and people of different equations have a different experience and different background and different conceptual mindset about police. And they're, they're more likely than not to say the person is justified by their actions. So I, I, would, I would lean toward it being a conviction, but I don't think it's a slam dunk by any means. And this, thank you, B. And the sad part, and I want you guys to chime in. We made a, a uh, heat. If we get one or two questions, folks that want to ask questions, if you do have a question, anyone on the chat, put it in the chat so Heath and I can see it and we can let you guys come in with some level of structure. Uh, Brian, it was interesting. Uh, recently, I heard a Malcolm X speech. It was an old Malcolm X speech. And what he referenced was the propaganda or the branding of America to criminalize Black people to criminalize the idea Correct. of what a black person is so that mm -hmm. it really would give context to when you see a police officer killing a black person, the, con the consciousness of the country won't feel bad because they already attach a criminal nature to black Americans. And then that even goes into the courtroom that the jurors, mm -hmm. the judge, they already see black people through this lens. So not only does it get murky in the actual case, Brian, but it gets murky in the judicial process. Would you agree with that? 100%. And it goes even further than that. We, we're Black people. We have even been indoctrinated in that same mindset to a certain degree. We, we, we are, we are uh, I never forget, I, had, I, I moved back to D.C. when I was about 24 years old and I went to, was going to a party in Baltimore. I had never spent any time in Baltimore before, uh, other than since I was a little kid. And I'm on this street, and it was a very, very pleasant street, very nice street, nice homes, whatever. And we get lost, and you take a, a wrong left and a wrong right, and I'm in this, this like straight hood. And I begin to get nervous, you know, and, and nothing had happened to me. There was nobody coming to my car. There was no, no, nothing that was going on against me personally, but I begin to get nervous. We have also been indoctrinated to fear our own people. Uh, and so if, if, if we have that fear, why well, may be small within us, imagine what white folks fear. You know, you can go back and look at the minstrel shows of, 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 the, of the early days, back and look at everything from how we portrayed in movies to cartoons to, to countless depictions in, in, a, in, a, in a publications about how you are to fear the black man. The big bad black man that's been passed down from generation to generation. We we, we bring up the um, everybody's been talking about the uh, Black Wall Street that started from a black boy bumping up against the foot of a white girl in elevator. That's where all that started from. He scuffed her shoe on a crowded elevator, but it became a black man assaulting a black. I'm sorry, a white girl. And so the, the mindset is a powerful thing. And, and, and talking about 400 years of indoctrination that, that where we sit as Americans today. So let's move on. You know what's crazy? And I think all African-Americans or I even say indigenous people that have experienced this police brutality, um, the, the thing that looms with all of us, and I'm talking to the whole group, the thing that looms with all of us, and I know it does with me, is every single time someone is killed, there's no closure because right. we as a people know that in the next 30 to 60 to 90 days, it's almost guaranteed it's going to happen again. And right. keeping the conversation moving forward, not long after George Floyd, 
Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor, we had another shooting and it took place in Atlanta. Um, but before I get to that speakers, I want to get to the Atlanta case. Thank you, B, for that, for that, for that update. I appreciate you. Hey, I Brother Heath, do we have any questions from the, from the group? So um, in terms of questions, one thing, just I want to say this up front. Can you put the name of the speaker who's speaking when you ask your question at the front of your question so we know what to attribute it to uh, because it helps with the, the channeling of the question. How do you fight a system that is literally set up for you to lose? Literally, how is it even a possibility without force and sending individual bo individuals bodies so they know you mean business? Um, was so he, can we have that person ask that question versus you reading it? Yeah, sure. Samuel, Leah, um, you can go for ask your question. Brother Sam, it's on you, brother. And Sam's not asking. Um, we also have a question at the bottom here, uh, Marcellus Kirkland. Can we also address the lynchings going on that are being ruled as suicide? We'll definitely get to that. We'll definitely get if to I, that. If, um, so if, again, guys, if, if you that, have a question, go ahead, Brian. Brian, get a point? No, yeah, that, that, that first question, if, if you can read that again, I, want, I, I think I want to touch on that for a quick second. How do you fight a system that's literally set up for you to lose? Well, here, here's the thing about the system. People always say the system is broken. It's not broken. It's working exactly the way it was constructed to work. So we got we to understand that going into it. The second thing is, when we it's a whole conversation about defunding the police right now. And I want to stress, that needs to be that needs to be uh, uh, discussed in a, in a different format because I understand the concept of what they're saying and defunding the police. What they're, from my understanding, what they're really saying is taking money from the police and putting it into other areas that would be beneficial, like mental health people, like counselors, like people, situations with, without force to de-escalate the situation. That needs to be expressed. What'll happen is, the other side will use that term, defund the police, to denigrate our message, to denigrate our movement and flip it around to something that we weren't even talking about. That's number one. Number two, if we get to that point to that conversation is more flushed out, we as communities, unfortunately, most of our communities are still very, very segregated. We have to use that to our advantage. We have to use, we can put things in place to police our own communities. We have to put mechanisms in place that we can't destruct, deconstruct their system, but we can construct our own system within our own communities. And we can go to these city council meetings, we can go to these, these state meetings, and we can, we can get involved and say, look, let us do our own thing, pool our resources, get funding through grants, get funding through legislature, because we're still paying taxes on, on in these areas, and come up with plans for our own communities to police ourselves that has to be part of the conversation because we can't waste them to deconstruct their system that's been around for 400 years so very quickly uh uh tamara torbert has a question tamara can you unmute um, yourself and get mic'd up good afternoon everyone um tamara torbert here so brian I, I i get what you're saying and i'm hearing the, the logistics. i'm just gonna be honest with you I wasn't called to study the law, right? And most of us out here, when we think about in layman's terms, what it is that we need to understand, how we need to motivate, I'm looking for what do I need to ask for to push through that gray matter that you talked about? You know, I'm looking for how do I educate myself or where are the platforms? How do we mobilize those resources, platforms that allow me and others to, you know, get involved and understand what's happening. Because I, I see your point, brother. I see the, the, the silver lining. Once we all get to that, that place, because we're out here putting on memes on social media, things of that nature about the funding of the police, and we don't even understand what that means to the point at which you just so eloquently placed. So we're saying stuff that's marginalizing our efforts, and we don't even know that we're working against ourselves. So where are those resources? Right. So Tammy, well, it's funny. It's funny that you asked that um, because throughout this conversation, we're going to be addressing that. We're going to re really be flushing out what it means to defund the police. We're going to be addressing some of these things, and we're going to close on what are some action steps we can do 
to find our voice in the conversation. So thank you for teeing that up. Guys, going back to it, and uh, please make sure, as I'm looking at some of your, your visuals, some of you guys, uh, your Wi-Fi connections may be a little blurry because uh, you're chopping in and out. And make sure your camera on your laptop that is not smudged so we get a good, clean picture of who you are. Um, as we move on to the conversation, I'm always cognizant of time. Right after these, these cases went through, everybody's riled up and everybody's like just upset and pissed off. All of a sudden, you have another shooting, another shooting uh, with a police officer shooting an unarmed black man, and his name was Rayshard Brooks. With that being said, I have two individuals that I selected to come on and talk about it. The first person, he's a deputy sheriff in the city of Atlanta. I met him years ago. He's connected to our DMSI, to Morehouse Pipeline. He's been a mentor working with our guys going down there for quite some time. Shout out to our brother, our mutual friend, Curtis Valentine. Uh, deputy Sheriff Mike Page, tell us some updates on Rayshard uh, Brooks, and we'll kind of go from there and also introduce uh, Chief Williams of the Prince George Community College Police as well. Mike Page. Hey, how's it going, man? Appreciate you for having me on for this conversation. A um, couple updates with Mr. Brooks. Both officers were, were arrested. Um, Garrett Rofe, they gave him a murder, a murder charge, and he was set with no bond. And uh, Mr. Devin Bronson, who was the other officer involved, he, he received a 50K bond, and he was released. He had four counts to include aggravated assault. But what is happening is he's participating as a state's witness. So... The, the DA, Paul Howard, is working with him to, I guess, to, you know, to try to lessen the charges. But he also, he got some serious charges because after um, Mr. Brooks was killed or he was dying, uh, he stood on his, he stood on top of his shoulders. He actually stood on his body. So um, that's pretty much the update on that. Um, his funeral was, um, I believe, yesterday, day before yesterday at Ebenezer Baptist Church, um, which is also a moving situation. And uh, the, the situation over at the Wendy's, it's still tense. There, uh, it's to the point now where um, the young, young, there are young men holding long guns, shotguns, protecting the area, and they're actually telling white people to when white people come over there to, to get away. Um, there's been a situation where a young white girl was shot. They were they got into a shootout. So it's it's pretty tense. It's, it's pretty tense down here. To be to be totally honest, uh, the, the the community is fed up, and rightfully so. Um, What's your yeah. thoughts, man? You've been in law enforcement quite some time. In layman's terms, as, as, as Tamara Torbert talked about, what are your thoughts on that case from start to finish, from the time the cops came to his car and saw him asleep in his car to the time they shot him in his back four times? You're a law enforcement officer. We're not. Give us your viewpoint. So the day it happened, I'll give you kind of what happened. I was actually working at a part-time job as a sheriff. And I received the video before everybody did from a fellow law enforcement officer. And he expressed his disgust. And I looked over it and I make sure when I look at things, I look at them objectively and not from a blue side or a law enforcement side because I'm black. I take off the uniform. So when I looked at it, I observed it and I, I, I broke it down, every piece of it. And I said, okay, he was fighting with them. That's one. But once he, he started to get up, he took the guy's taser. But here's the issue that people are not understanding, and, and law enforcement officers in particular. Once the threat is leaving, Supreme, Supreme, uh, Supreme Court laws, they, they, they justify you cannot shoot a, a fleeing suspect who's not violent. Even though he got into a fight with the individual, there's no, because your threat is leaving, it's called AOJ, Ability Opportunity Jeopardy. When that person is leaving, that threat no longer exists. So in my mind, I don't care. The cop basically got his ass handed to him. Take your ass whooping. Take out a warrant on, this, on the individual. Find him. You know his information. He gets to live another day. The judge gets to make that determination, not you. See, what's happening is these officers are, they're, they're so in tune with enforcing the law and they lose common sense, in my opinion. So common sense would tell you, okay, I have everything I, I need to enforce the law. I can, I can still go get them. I have all this information. We ran him, did a DUI check, get another unit, call them. But unfortunately, in these cases, most times, black men don't get that chance. Black women don't get that opportunity. And that's just the honest truth about it. And it, I was angry. And a lot of, some of my officer friends, they, they felt the other way, but a lot of my officer friends agree with me. Like, it was total BS. Um, he shouldn't have died. 
he shouldn't have died that day. And in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, I don't speak for uh, the officer that I work for. I, I don't speak for my opinion, based on the facts and circumstances and the law, he was unjustly murdered. This is interesting too, because what tends to happen is that public perception you're talking about. And what I think people realize is that sometimes, well, a lot of times, when you're not black, you get a second thought. You get a consideration. I saw a video, and I'm pretty sure you saw it too. I saw a video where a white male was pulled over. He beat up the two cops, took their baton, beat them with their own baton, got in their cruiser, and took the police cruiser and drove away. And when they finally caught him, he was apprehended and taken to jail alive and prosecuted. So it just tends to be this double standard and that bias, but I know it's hard for you because you are an officer, but you're also a black male. Where do you stand in these situations of these double standards? Man, it's funny because speaking of race and, and, and a lot of times I work at, uh, you know, a lot of different places and I get approached by, uh, you know, white Americans who say, you know, I feel sorry for what's going on in law enforcement. And I, and I quickly put them in a the place. I said, one thing you have to understand is that I'm black. I can't take this skin off. So I could be Rashad Brooks unless I unless I pull out my badge and say, hey, don't do this to me. I'm, I'm an officer. Why should I be afforded the opportunity? Every citizen should have that exact same opportunity to not be harassed, not, not to be unfairly uh, abused at the hands of law enforcement because really the laws were put in place to protect the citizens from the from the very people who are attacking them that's what the laws from the government so it's like america says one thing but it strays away from its, its actual vision and then protects those who who violate those visions who you know I, I you know i have a hard time and i put people in their place all the time like you know it's not about it's not about that these people are upset everybody's upset for a reason and i'm upset as well because it, if you look at the law because i know the law and I know how it applies because I have uh, extensive training. Um, and I know it's not right. And I know it's not equally, it's not equally handed out. The law, even in cases where where something as simple as um with that with that young, I can't recall the case exactly with his sister. She cheated on it, she 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 bust her, she she lied on her address so she could bust her child to a, a different district. I remember that. Yeah. lies on a test so her child can get in school. The girl gets five years and she gets, you know, probation. So, you know. It's just unevenly weighed. They don't apply laws correctly, in, in my opinion, sometimes. And that's why people are upset. And I know and I get it because I'm black before I put on my uniform. And when I take off the uniform, I'm still black. Brother Heath, do we have any questions uh, before we start this slide kind of transition? Any questions in our chat? So what I'm seeing is a number of comments. And as I believe Mr. Page was speaking, someone mentioned uh, privately to me. Um, so did Richard Brooks deserve to die? I mean, if you would have, you know, heard my chat, of, of course not. Right. He, he was in, the, the young man was intoxicated. He was, the whole time, he was cordial. Um, even though he was a convicted felon, that had nothing to do with the interaction. He was asking why I was being, arrest, I was being arrested. And also, DA Paul Howard pointed out his press conference that the, the, the officer never stated, you're under arrest. So, Right by law, I have a right to resist what I feel is an, an unlawful arrest. So I'm not granted that right. So of course he did not deserve to die. He's a flint. He's a, he he got into a fight with an officer. Happens all the time. Happens. So you heard uh, Trayvon Trayvon Martin's mother come out and say that she's not for um, abolishing the police. Um, and then you have a question in the chat here from Armstrong Addy, who says, "Would it be a smart idea to fund the police more?" and get better training for cops, to get better trained cops and quality cops. Hey, Brother Armstrong, are you there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, answer your question, sir. I mean, I'm just, this is like a basic idea because I understand how like the police system works, but it can, it can get into a whole lot of tangent, but whatever. I had just a day, because because I've seen this a Talk about defunding to police. Uh, I mean, defunding the police and all that kind of stuff. And some wants to like to abolish the police off right. And there's just a whole lot of stuff like that. But the idea that keeps coming up is that we should actually train our officers more and to get better quality training into like stuff like um, 
mental health and like the escalation training and like stuff like that. So I don't know if that would be like a good idea. And then and then it's also like the uh, police unions themselves, but that's that's one that's one of leaving that that. So let's do this. Let's address that, Mike. Before you get into it, I also want to bring in uh, someone who's near and dear to my heart. He came on to our last. Good question, uh, Brother Armstrong. Uh, he is the chief of police, newly hired at Prince George Community College. Uh, her name is Graylin Williams. Uh, welcome to the call, Brother Williams. He may be muted. All right. <laughs> there, yeah, I was muted. Williams, I'm sorry. Sir. Thank you. It's okay. So really quickly, uh, again, thank you so much again for coming back on our part two. As you've been listening, we're talking about the Rayshard Brooks case. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I wanted to address you about, the chatter around the country is that, why is he getting charged? All these extensive charges that Derek Chauvin, that seemed to be more guilty of doing something really wrong, got lesser charges. Can you speak to that charge count for Atlanta versus what we're seeing happen with uh, Derek Chauvin with George Floyd? So the, you're talking about the charge count for the police officers in Atlanta? The police officers in Atlanta, yes. Well, I, I really, I, it would be difficult for me to talk to that because again, you're talking about the state of Georgia versus the state of Minnesota, you know, different laws and everything. Uh, with the Rayshard in Atlanta, so he's running away. He's got a taser, supposedly. You know, he turns like this, like he's going to fire the taser. Now, I, I don't know if he could have fired that taser because from what I was told, the taser had already been fired twice. And I think that that's once, once you use the taser twice, that's it. The, th the thing has to be reset and all of that. But then again, it's less than lethal force. So if I shoot you with the taser, what's gonna happen is you'll, you'll, you know, you'll lose all motor control and you'll go down. Now the police will argue that now I'm in jeopardy because theoretically you've got me down on the ground. If it's just, for instance, if it's just me and, and Mike Page, he tases me. I got my gun belt on and he's holding me down and I can't move. He, he can step over, grab my gun and shoot me. I don't know if that situation really existed in Atlanta, number one. Number two, you had two officers. So his backup was also on his way coming. Personally speaking, I have to agree. There's, there's a, a, a sister whose name I can't remember. She's retired from LAPD and she's a sergeant. And she said, and she was very candid. And, you know, she came right out and said, what was going on is these two guys saw themselves in the locker room the next day being ribbed that you let a drunk guy kick both your asses and take your taser and run off. And you didn't do anything, you know? And there's some individuals in law enforcement, unfortunately, that should not be in law enforcement. And they don't have the, the fortitude to just suck it up. Yeah, you lost that one, you know, uh, boom, you got the guy's car. Number one, he, he left his car, just like uh, Deputy Page said, you got his information. You can go for an arrest warrant and go find him, whatever. But to, again, to, to now you're using deadly physical force. You know, so I, I, I just don't and see. It. And then you act like, like Deputy Pay said, when he's on the ground, you actually stand on his. Yeah, ground. that that whole thing is extremely egregious. I, I just don't understand why you would do that. You know, the the thing in 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 with with George Floyd. I mean, you know, what, what we're talking almost nine minutes, and you got the people standing in there videotaping this and they're screaming, hey, stop it, stop it, stop it. Come on, can't you, can't you see, you can't breathe. And here's Chauvin who gives this like, look like, yeah, okay, he can't breathe. Yeah, and you know, we're, we, we, we got him under control. I have to go with the first speaker too to, to, to find out what happened, all right? Because again, you see him taken out of his car one officer has him, has the cuffs on him, brings him over to the wall, sits him down. Everything's cool. They then take him up. They 
take them across the street and they put them in the police vehicle. Now, I don't know what happened, but you see afterwards, there's another video that shows them fighting now in the police, in the back of the police vehicle. Now, I don't know if they're going to claim that he was kicking out the windows or he was kicking the door or whatever, but for whatever reason, they went into the vehicle and were struggling with him. And then somebody made the decision to take him out of the vehicle now and put him down on the ground. Again, I don't, I don't know what was going through their head or, or, or whatever. Uh, so that's bad. And now you put him on his, on his stomach. You know, I mean, they already tell you, you know, you don't put a baby to sleep on, on their stomach, on their chest because of the way we breathe. So you got him now on his stomach. He's still handcuffed. Let's not forget that. That's a big piece here. When somebody's handcuffed, you're not supposed to be, you know, the old word, you know, it was tuning them up. You're not supposed to be doing that. You know, if he's kicking at you or whatever, you try to control that individual the best way you can, or at least try to get him in a vehicle, you know, strap him in and get him, uh, you know, to to jail or to, or, to, or to the lockup, wherever you're going to process him. You know, what's going on? Let me interject. Uh, and, and, I, and I want I want to be able to address my Marcellus you Kirkland. page and you, Chief. Oh, okay. What's the question? Go ahead. We have a question from Marcellus Kirkland. Marcellus, you want to go ahead and ask it? Sure, I'll, I'll ask you. Uh, so this is a question, or first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Marcellus Kirkland. I'm a rising junior sociology major, currently at Morehouse College from Prince George County, Maryland. I attended PGCC during from 2017 to 2019, and I was in the DMSI program during my time there. Uh, my question is to the black officers in this chat. So I actually have a friend, one of my close friends. He is currently a criminal justice major at Hampton University entering his senior year. and uh, throughout his college career, throughout his matriculation, he had aspirations of becoming a police officer. But with everything going on, he's really reconsidering uh, whether or not this is what he wants to do as a Black man in America. And so, you know, to my question is to the Black officers in this chat, uh, in this Zoom call, you know, what are your thoughts about that? What is your advice to him uh, in dealing with being a, both a police officer and a Black man in America? Here's, here's my thing. I, I'll take this one first. Uh, I'm also a Morehouse graduate. Hey, Morehouse brother. Um, this is my thing. People say defund the police, F the police, whatever. But it's like you have to be in the system to affect change in the system. We could not affect laws if we did not become congressmen. We cannot affect how our how, how we are treated in, in the medical profession if we didn't become doctors. So we still need black police officers. We need them now more than ever because someone with my perspective, if we had more of me, we'd have less of those issues. But what happens is you, you have some officers who get involved in these police departments and they become silent and they become um, complicit. So it's important that brothers who, who believe that right is right, who believe in, in the law, who believe in affecting the letter of law and not gonna go for any of it, it's, a, it's, a, it's imperative that that young brother still pursues his vision based on, you know, based on anything. Cause there, there are black police chiefs who are coming in, who are coming into uh, fruition and coming into positions right now who are opening cases and firing officers who do racist things. So if he stops, he might not be that police chief that we need to enforce to make change or become that DA, that prosecutor to, to be in those positions. So it's very important that he continues his journey and, you know, times are the times is going to always be friction. We have to figure out our way through it. And bowing out of the conversation is not an option. Exactly. I would, I would encourage him to continue on exactly as Mike Page has said. We need to be in the system. It's fine to fight the power and be outside and, 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 and fight the system and everything. But we need more of us in the system. I put in the chat, there's a book that if you all get a chance, you can probably find it on Amazon, Black Police in America by Dr. W. Marvin Dulaney. He traces the history of African-Americans in policing in this country, okay? And for those of you that don't know real quick, how many have ever, ever heard of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, 
patty rollers or the slave patrols. Yeah, that's 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 how policing started. Exactly. Exactly. There was a time in this country yeah. where police officers into that, into that. Black police officers were only allowed to police in black communities. All right. I can tell you from reading the book, you know, I used to be the chief of internal affairs for Baltimore City PD. Okay. My history in policing dates back to 1981. So that's how long I've been in law enforcement. There was a time in Baltimore, black police officers, 1966, were not allowed to patrol in Mark uh, Baltimore City police cruisers because they were black. So if they were going to be in a cruiser, they had to be in an unmarked vehicle, even though they were in uniform and everything. And again, only allowed to patrol in black neighborhoods. All right. We need to be at the table. We need to be inside. The one thing that the public never really hears about is the racism. You think it's racism externally? Come join the police department. Well, let me, let me interject right here. The we recently had a police chief here in Prince George's County resign. Exactly. And when talking to come of my people that work in the county, the reason was, was all the racism and the, and the things that were happening within the Prince George's Police Department. But let, let's move to this. And Mike Page, I want to go to you first and I'll come back to you, Chief. Since this incident, Mike, in Atlanta, with Ray Shard and these, and these, Kate, and these charges were given to that officer, there's been what's called the blue flu, where all these Atlanta police officers have called off from work, where they say, you know what? We don't like those charges. We don't think he was given due, pro due process. We're not coming to work. And all of a sudden, the city of Atlanta is operating on a skeleton crew. Mike Page, you're in Atlanta. Tell me about your thoughts on the blue flu and police officers protesting. My, my thought is, is despicable. It's their way of kicking and screaming because they're not getting their way. And, and first of all, I'm a sheriff. A sheriff is a constitutional officer, which is above a police officer as far as the constitution is concerned. So I, I hold myself to a different standard. We didn't we didn't have those issues. You can't, you can't, I mean, this is what you signed up to do. You knew, I knew getting in when I put on this uniform, it's like it's the represent police officers get mad, right? Because Okay, people say F the police. You knew that your, sim your, your, your uniform was a form of oppression. If you understand history, you understand the slave patrols, you understand that that is a representation of the slave patrols went to collect slaves. So that is the history of policing. So you have to know that your uniforms, first of all, represents that. It's up to you to, to break down that barrier with the community, in my opinion. Now, them calling in as a form of protest, you. I mean, I know in my SOP, we weren't allowed to protest. And everybody calls in at the same time. It's a creative protest. So they can't really say it, it, they're a protest because you really can't prove if they're sick or not. So it's kind of a hard thing. But I, me personally, I don't like it. You come to work. A big ticket item for all of you to think about is what kind of policing do you want? And I will use Freddie Gray as an example. This is how it works. So Freddie Gray's out there, he's hanging out, you know, doing his thing, living his life. You know, the police officers are out there and I think they were both on bicycles or something. They were bicycle cops. And so they see him, he sees them. Next thing you know, he takes off running. So stop right there. Everybody says, well, it's not against the law to run from the police. And that is the God's honest truth. It is not against the law to run from the police. But what happens is, why did he run becomes the question. And does the public, do you as the public, do you want me to figure out why he ran? Did he have dope on him? Did he have a gun on him? Was there outstanding arrest warrant on him? Or had he just committed a crime that because he saw the police officers, thought he thought maybe they knew that he committed a crime and they were gonna grab him anyway, and that's why he ran. So now the question becomes, do you want your police officer to pursue that individual, stop them, do what is called a field interview and find out who are you, what's going on, why'd you run from us, that was suspicious. That becomes the, the, the question for the community. Do you want that? If you don't want that, 
then that's what, you know, the training in police academies and stuff like that, that's where that has to be focused at. That that's not the kind of policing we want. Because again, if you look at the police department as an organization, the police department has performance metrics. And one of the performance metrics is to be, you know, uh, proactive rather than reactive. We should be out there trying to keep the, the, uh, the, the crime rate down somehow. And, and they'll send officers out, believe me. You know, I was up there. They'll tell officers, hey, I need you guys. We had a shooting in such and such district. district. Get out there. If you see any guys that look like they're uh, banging, you know, deter get, get a reason to stop them and question them. See if you can pat them down, see if they're carrying a weapon on them. No Aggressive police tactics. If we don't want that, then that's what we need to tell the police. That's not the kind of policing we want in our community. All and right. My opinion as a sheriff, I don't want that because too many times, and here's the reason, too many times that has become the justification of murder. They have too many times they have justified the murder of these black males because, oh, he was suspicious. So I chased him. And there's a, there's a case in uh, Clayton County, Georgia, where it just came back up. Officer, they were called and he, he was driving up and he said these, these young men were smoking weed. Mm -hmm. All of the young men, of course, they're going to run. They're young, 17, 16 years old. Take off running. One hops the fence. Officer tases him. Young man falls, breaks his neck. So at some point you have to start to weigh like, OK, is that worth it? I mean, it just, I don't want that kind of aggressive police. Personally, if, if the man is not doing anything, if he, I mean, if he takes off and he's running, you don't have a reason to chase him. What's the. The reason uh, to chase him is to see why he ran. But let's, let's, let's will see, be let's the excuse. This, I want to, I want to make sure our next topic is addressing what you guys are talking about. Uh, first of all, before we get to our next topic, brother Heath, any questions? I see a lot of chats. I see a lot of comments. That's what I realized, guys. Let me just get this serious about my people in the chat room. One thing I'm getting tired of, and I'm talking about the entire world, not just my DMSI guys, not just the participants online, is a lot of people who are real ready to comment from behind the computer screen. But when it comes time to put their face behind it and they make a comment or they have a question, people get real scared. Guys, now is the time to be active. If you have something to say, speak up, say it correctly, think it through, but don't sit there with all these experts on this panel and you're, and I see the, the comments, he should do this. Why are they doing this? If you have a question, I coached you guys up well. You say, excuse me, I have a question. I'd like to raise my hand. Do we have any questions, guys? Hey, he, I'd like to say, we never addressed that, gen that young man's question who, who asked it the first one. Which one was it? Well, well he was about, it was about training. Um, Oh, training in terms of improved training. Go ahead. We'll let you answer, but then we'll transition. But we'll also get to that on defunding the police. In exactly. We'll, we'll wait then. We'll wait okay. then. So, guys, with that being said, we have two more people. Thank you guys so much, man, Mike and the Chief. I hope you guys can stay on and answer some more questions. Yeah, no problem. Uh, the next two people coming up, again, it, I don't think you guys realize there's a quote that says, it's not your net work, it's your net, it's not your net worth, it's your net work. I have had the blessed opportunity to meet some incredible people since I've lived in this area. And one person in particular, um, I met very early on. He, he'll be our next presenter. Um, I met him because I moved here to become an educator. I went to South Carolina State to become an educator. I moved to this area. I love seeing upwardly moving people look like me. And I wanted to move to an area that had that. One of the first people I met, he was an educator. He was a hip hop artist. Um, he was just doing it all. And me coming from Pittsburgh, I never knew you could have a full-time job and then pursue your passion. I thought people just worked all day and then they went home. I saw him and he was teaching class and developing curriculum and then turn around and do hip-hop shows all across the country. Our next two speakers, and I'm going to introduce the second one when she's ready because I want to give her her, her, her alley-oop as well, is uh, Ash Gabriel Ashru Ben to come on and talk about defunding the police. Brother Gabe. Hello, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Brother Gabe. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've been listening to the conversation and it's um, very insightful. I, I guess my, um, my stance on the defunding of the police is um, 
I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that I'm for completely defunding, like abolishing police. Um, and I know that's a controversial stance, but I do I do think that the police forces are overfunded. And um, and what happens is with that overfunding, uh, they tend to over police and and over harass communities that are under under resourced. So um, with that funding and with all of that amplification of, of, of artillery and cars and helicopters and all the stuff, the military grade things that are being acquired for the police, what they're doing with that equipment is oppressing communities that do not have resources. So it's really like bullying our own communities. And um, that's where the frustration is. And my question, and I asked it in the chat, but my question around a lot of this um, that I've been hearing from the gentleman sharing is, when a situation happens and a cop kills an unarmed black man, which has happened, which is happening all the time, what what is the accountability on on the part of his fellow colleagues, officers, when the cop comes back to the precinct after doing something like that? What is the energy? Is there a conversation like, "Yo, what's going?" You know, because if it, what it seems like from the outside looking in is it's protected. The action is protected. And, you know, you made a mistake, but, you know, you on the right team type thing. And so I just need to know, that's my, that's really what my question is. And I kind of wanted to open up the conversation around, um, the, you know, thoughts around what defunding the police would actually look like. So Chief, I see you with your hand up. Let's go to Kelly. And Kelly, let's let's flush that out to answer Gabe's question. And then if Mike or the chief wants to respond, we'll do it as well. Guys, the next person coming up is a good friend of mine. Uh, I met her at Prince George's. And it's so funny because when I met her, she was working at Prince George's in some capacity. Uh, and I remember she and I were having a conversation. And I'm sharing dreams. And she's sharing dreams. And I'm sharing dreams. And she's sharing dreams. And then I just started cheerleading. Like, come on, Kelly, when you doing this? When you doing that? And we've been great friends ever since then. Uh, she does a collaborative work for the Brian Heat brand in terms of PR all over the country. She's a dynamo, a great, a great mom. Her son is amazing. With that being said, introducing uh, Kelly Davis of Kelly Maven Media, and she's going to talk a little bit more about defunding the police. Kelly, thank you, Brian, um, and thank you, Ashuru, for opening the conversation in that way. I'm a communicator by profession um, in different capacities. So I want to talk about how we use words and how the meaning of it really matters. So one of the per people asked a question about defunding and how that sounds like taking all the money away. And abolishment is also a movement that people want, want to have. They want the police uh, forces abolished. So those are two different conversations. And so we're going to keep the abolishment conversation out. We're not talking about getting rid of police departments. We're going to just talk about defunding. And defunding the police departments means really means redirecting funding. Right now, as, as Ashru said, police departments are overfunded. And they've been overfunded to a point of militarization. That's why we have police departments with tanks. Why do you need a tank somewhere in someone's neighborhood? We have um, you know, assault rifles and grenades and things of that nature that we don't need in our communities. And so when you redirect or defund the police department, you take a portion of that money and redirect it to important social services that matter to communities. Mental health, education, jobs, things that prevent crime, because we know where crime comes from. It's a recipe. It's a, it's a recipe from lack, from people who are in need. And since it was designed for us to be in lack, They had jobs and they had everything they needed. Who's going outside to knock someone in the head and take something away from them? Nobody's going to do that. So that's what defunding the police really means. It means redirecting that money to a space where communities can be healed. So because police officers and um, um, Deputy Cage and um, um, Mr. Gray Williams can speak to this, they're not equipped to do some of the things that we have them out there doing. You're not a psychologist, you know. You're, you know, you're, you're not a do domestic violence um, therapist, and all these kind of things. Public safety and policing are also two different things. Public safety. I think it was uh, Mr. Taylor earlier who mentioned that we can police ourselves. That's about public safety, keeping property and people safe. But policing is the the descendant of the slave the slave um, 
patrols. That's what policing is. Public safety is protecting the community. So again, those words matter. What they mean matter. And so we do not want to, um, to, to abolish these police departments. We want to take that money and redirect it. And we want to use some of that money for training. We do want to train officers. But think about this. Everybody talks about reform and, re and training and body cameras. None of those things have stopped anything. So we're not doing the right training. And then the other piece of this is that a thought process, a feeling about, how, about a, an individual because of their race, that's deep-seated. There are not many classes you can take to get rid of that. You can't teach someone to see someone as a human. So the, this stuff starts all the way at home. This stuff starts when, you know, when they come to you to be hired, there's a whole nother process that's, that has to happen so you can find out how people view other races and, and people in their community. And so I hope, you know, some of the takeaways which you've gotten from what I've said is that defunding does not mean ending. It means redirecting resources to prevention so that police services are in put in, the, in a position of being everything to our communities. And there should be some training done more training um, and consistent training and education with officers so that they are prepared to work in the communities that they are supposed to keep safe. Kelly, do you believe, thank you, Kelly, do you believe that it's going to be a cookie cutter approach to defunding or does it, is it area by area based on how it, it absolutely works? has to be area by area. So let's look at Camden. Um, so there's places where this has happened in, um, in small amounts, um, but, in Camden, there was so much corruption. They had to like scrape the police department just all the way out. They had to disband it and build it from the bottom up. That's not defunding the police. They got rid of a, a bad and corrupt system and replaced it, but they replaced it with the same tenants that um, had been there before. But just with people who believed in um, actually doing the right thing. So you still have some of the same issues, but you have better people in place and, and better systems, but they have not been defunded in this traditional way that we are asking. Um, of course, you know, my son is creeping up on me to ask a question while I'm talking. So, um, and then in Dallas, there's a small police department in Dallas where th they took some of the money and they started to put social workers on staff with police, with police officers. Okay, so we have a domestic violence call. Um, we have a mental health call. We need a professional to come out there with us in order to see the, you know, to figure out the situation. And that buddy system has shown great um, strides for improvements in communities because there's no, these people are trained to de-escalate it. I'm just here to make sure that nothing gets violent, nothing gets out of control. But most of the time, the professionals are able to handle the situation and the police are there just to keep everyone safe public safety. Good. Hey, Chief and Mike Page, let's, let's, let's talk about something that Kelly just talked about just now. We're talking about defunding the police. We're talking about taking away resources. I've been told, uh, Mike Page or Chief uh, Williams, that that's not going to work. That taking no. money away from the police is not going to change anything. And they're against it. These are people within the law enforcement community. Uh, Mike Page or, or Chief Williams, please speak to that with regard to defunding the police and Kelly's last statement about having these mental health professionals come out with you to these calls to help you de-escalate. Do you think, in a, in a concise response, do you believe these things will help? Yes, I do. I think that, you know, to, to her point, there's too, there's too much, you know, uh, tanks and, I mean, it's it's wonderful, it's sexy, but you know, we don't need that. That's not what you need for policing, you know, for real policing, okay? To her point, when you get the call that, uh, you know, Graylin has, has PTSD, he hasn't taken his medication in three days and he's acting out, okay? Now you're gonna send a police officer that, you know, has not been trained to work with, with uh, people with mental health issues. So that police officer is going to get there and they're going to try and manage this situation the best way they can. Now, I don't know what that, you know, includes other than trying to, you know, you know let's see if we can get them to a hospital or something like that. So we'll call for uh, an ambulance or whatever. But as soon as that individual, you know, feels like he can't handle it and he may grab some kind of weapon, then all bets are off, as opposed to sending a healthcare 
a, a mental health care professional to that situation, somebody that deals with people in mental crisis every day, works in that environment and walks into that house and says, okay, I'm trained to, to deal with this. It's the same thing, and I'll, and I'll shut up and let Mike talk. It's the same thing for me as the whole thing of having uh, school resource officers. Now, school resource, resource officers are, are, were good in their time, but as time went on, you know, and I, and I ask any teacher on here to excuse me, but as time went on, as soon as some kid spoke out of class or wouldn't uh, stop mm -hmm. talking or, or I, I told you to go down to the principal's office, as soon as that kid wouldn't move, get the cop, get the mm -hmm. cop. We're bringing a cop in to take a kid physically, forcibly down to the principal's office. That's not what the, the officer, that's like, it's the same thing as if you brought a Marine or, a, or a, you know, a Green Beret into your classroom. You, you don't need that. You need people that are trained to do that kind of thing. And you really, I'm against, I would really be against trying to train the police to do mental health care work. Mm -hmm. That you, We have people that are already professionals to do that. Yeah. I agree, Brother Mike. Uh, well, first of all, let's get it clarified. Like when they say defund the police because of tanks and things of that nature, you got to understand that the government is complicit because a lot of these things you don't, it's no budget involved. All you have to do is write a, a grant or proposal and the government will give you these things because they have it in surplus. So they're not actually going and spending money to acquire these tanks. They're already in the government. Um, secondly, because I'm a sheriff, I see it a little different. They automatically train because of the the defunding of mental health institutions. The jail has now become a mental health institution. So what they have trained sheriffs and people who work in jail settings, you are now a mental health officer. So you have to become trained in uh, crisis intervention training. And we have we talk to mental health officials all the time. So. At the sheriff's office, that's why I look, see it kind of different. We're trained in de-escalation. So I would say that a lot of these police officers need to go work in a jail setting, but a lot of them are scared to work without the, the gun. So when you don't have a gun, you have to use your talk game. You have to use your de-escalation techniques because if you get into a fight with somebody, you're going to see them the next day. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> so you deal with it a little different. Well, officers, they're so used to locking people up and throwing away the key that they don't even want to deal with that at all. So there has to be some cert, some some middle ground that officers have to say, okay, I know this is not what I'm paid for, you know, but this is what I have to do. And 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 they also have to when they speak of defunding, raise the pay of some of these officers because you'll get a better quality person if you pay people correctly. People nobody want, wants quality. nobody wants to go through to four years of college to come out and become a cop and get paid. The salary right. that some of these guys exactly. get paid. Exactly. So you're going to get less quality people, people who don't process things well, people who came out of the military and they think they're they're patrolling insurgents. So a lot of people come out of the military, they go into policing. So they're policing, they're policing neighborhoods that people don't look like them. They're already painted as criminals. So when they approach them, they have their guns on their head. They have their hands on their guns. So it's kind of a lot of things going on. Uh, in this in this whole thing, so if I if I if if, if we're gonna go with the defund the police narrative, I say we need to do a refund as well. Refund mental health, open mental institutions because the reason why a lot of this is happening because a lot of those institutions closed. So now, well, that's the redirection. Yeah, people, yeah, and they send that's people the right. They send people to jail and say, now jail officer, you're the mental health institution person. You're also you got to affect the law and you got to deal with all these things. So it's difficult, and then you're you're paying your wages you're paying isn't really worth what you have to do you know so it's it, it's a big mix but i'm I, i'm for the conversation somebody i i seen it on facebook it was a, a it was so eloquent and it, and it explained it to me he said you want to understand defund the police look at the suburbs they have they have opportunities out there they have programs but you don't see a lot of police presence you don't see police because they, they have what they need that's a perfect definition of defund the police and i finally i already agreed with it but i finally get the explanation you have to have resources the, the, term, the, the term defund the, the term defunding is killing us though right all, 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 this goes, all, all this goes, all this goes back to politics i want to get some hold on b 
I want to get some feedback from the students. So there's been a lot of questions, some, some different people in the chat. Anybody in, in, in the, the universe, we have a great attendance. You guys, we almost cracked 100 people on here. I'm, I'm passionate. Tell me, let's talk. Any students? Okay, any students? I see a question that I want to answer, please, on this segment. Because it came, through, it came through from like four people. And this is okay. flashing on my screen. People keep saying um, no amount of defunding or training can stop racism. So for all of you who said that in the chat, uh, you know, I said that originally, and you know, when I first spoke, that in this retraining, it's you cannot retrain that out of a police officer. We know that racism and ego and all this stuff is at the core of that. So I, I just want to make sure that you, everyone, understand that that's being acknowledged, and we're not saying here that there's a class that can make that go away. Because if you've been raised a racist person for 42 years, that's that's ingrained, and there's no, there's not many small conversations that's going to change that. So I want to make sure that you're, we're understanding that defunding and all that stuff, we're not saying that that will solve that problem. But when you do break a law or, you know, or do a racist act, if there is a consequence behind it, that is likely to affect behavior. Because right now there aren't any. So why would someone stop doing something? So if we can't change the way you think about it, we're going to change what happens when you do something. So we need to get some of that. Those consequences. That's right. Hey, guys, so let's, let's move on. And it's so funny. I'm watching the chat. And what's cool is the conversation's evolving right in line with the theme. What I keep seeing in the chat is all that's not going to stop racism. All that, everything that we're talking about, racism is the core of all these problems. No matter what you move around it, the quote becomes putting a Band-Aid over a gunshot wound. Mm -hmm. where they don't really want to deal with the wound itself is ingrained racism in this country. And this leads to our next point. And, I, and I'm, I'm keeping it a buck. Hey, guys, I know this is being broadcast, or it will be eventually. Since it's not being broadcast live, I can be real. I need some more of my DMSI guys to speak up. I need you guys to speak up. You guys are, are loud and brash. Don't let the energy of my speakers intimidate you. They want to hear from you. Hey, Brother Heath, are you there? Right here. Hello. Is it okay? Okay. Do we have any questions in the, in the room? Any questions from my guys? Can I say something? Is it okay if I speak? Absolutely, Brian. To go. I'd love to see your face, though, champ. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. All right. I got you. <laughs> All right. Hey, guys. Yeah. So I was watching this uh, this Brian, podcast. You turn your camera oh. the other way so it's horizontal. All right. Hey, guys. So uh, I was watching this podcast from uh, Joe Rogan, and that's his name. Yeah, and he, he was mentioning he was with Jocko Willing. Um, Jocko was um, he was I think he was in, in the seals, and he described how like they had to go through like a uh, eleven to twelve months of training for like a uh, I think a uh, two year um, I think two year program or two year uh, training or not training but. Uh, they, they were going somewhere for a certain mission or whatnot for two years, but they went through like 11 months of training. And then he was, he was talking about how like, and a lot of these departments, the training isn't as intense. They go through a couple hours a year of training, physical training. Um, and my question is like, what can we do to, to keep these like, uh, like, I don't know, to just make training more consistent so that officers aren't, don't get rusty and, you know, they don't, they don't do these things because, like, uh, a lot of these uh, these terrible things they're doing. Like, what can we do to keep it, like, consistent, like, high-quality uh, training, like, uh, in the SEALs or in the Army? Because what I'm seeing is that a lot of these officers are doing these things and aren't in peak condition, aren't in peak physical shape. And it's like, it doesn't make sense because their job requires, you know, you, re requires outstanding performance. And it's like, if they're not getting the right amount of training, especially every single day consistently or weekly, then they shouldn't be on the street like patrolling people. It doesn't make any sense compared to people like Jocko Willing, like in the SEALs. They were training every day for 11 months for a two-year mission or two-year um, uh, yeah, job in a different country. So it's like, it, it doesn't make any sense. Doctors are held at a, a certain standard. If they do something wrong, there's consequences. But these officers are watching us every single day. Brian, let me, let me address that. And I want Mike Page, I want Mike Page to, to answer that question. Chris Rock makes a joke 
because this new terminology, guys, you guys are watching CNN. CNN wants to keep referring to these bad police officers as bad apples. Oh, it's just a bunch of bad apples. But Chris Rock makes the joke that there are certain professions that you're not allowed to be a bad apple. You can't be a pilot and say, oh, he's just a bad apple. We'll work on his landing later. If he lands the plane incorrectly, people die. So he kept talking about the need to raise the standard. Brian, I know, wants to respond, and also Mike Page. Mike Page, real quick on, um, on increasing or changing the training, and let's go back to a Brother Taylor who wants to respond as well. Mike? Uh, for myself, um, there's extensive training. You know, I, I believe the police academy could be longer, but that's also a question of attrition. There's not a lot of officers on the street, so they try to get officers to the to the streets as fast as possible, so they don't have the you know, so they can make coverages and you know, for to have coverage to patrol neighborhoods, to work in the sheriff's office. So that's a whole nother issue, but it leads into that why that why the training is so so short and it's not as, as extensive. Like you can you can't train that long because you they need you in the street. So, um, more training. I think it's better judgment. I mean, you can train all day because the officer who shot uh, Richard Brooks, well trained, very hey, well trained. Hey, Mike, the guy Derek Chauvin, the guy Derek yeah. Chauvin in Minneapolis. Long, yeah, long he was career. Eighteen year veteran. Eighteen year veteran. It's not. A, it's not a matter of training. It's a matter of racism. It's a matter of bad judgment. It's a matter of looking at the people that you patrol as insurgents, as threats versus citizens. And Kelly, for me, I think Kelly agrees with you, bro. Problem. That's the problem. <laughs> See what hap what happens is in our communities, officers often patrol communities that they're not a part of, so they don't feel connected. They don't they don't interact with people. They don't talk. They don't they forgot what policing is supposed to be. Now I know when I'm out there, I'm making a I'm making a point to go out of my way to sometimes talk to a sister or brother. Any I mean just a citizen because I know what my uniform represents. It represents oppression. Let's be real. So to let people know that I'm not an oppressor and I'm a part of the community, I'm making an outward stretch. So if people, if officers aren't willing to do that, that use better judgment, then it doesn't matter. Training is not the problem. Hey, Mike, there's a question in the chat. Samuel? Oh, um, hey, hey, everyone. My name is Samuel Leah. Um, so pretty much uh, we had a discussion about racism. Um, and from my point of view, racism is a thing and racism can stop. The only issue is that people don't like reading books. It's a lack of education, which I feel as though is the main source of every, like the root of every problem. People feel as though they know like everything, like everything. And for me, like the police officer, um, the sheriff, I forgot his name. He made a lot of good points. And honestly, he kind of changed my point of view just based on him speaking. So like in my reality, it's like racism is a thing and race, you can end racism, but people just don't like reading books. And that's the main issue for me. Um, so that's pretty lack much what education. I like to have to say. Lack of education. Yeah, lack of education. Speak, speaking on that lack of education, a lot of the problems that we get, a lot of the reason we get into the problem with the police is that we don't understand the law. So we don't understand when the, what the police officer can and can't do when they approach us. So they say, can I search your vehicle? He asked you a question. He didn't say, I'm going to search your vehicle and you give him consent. You don't know that legally you don't have to. So we're not well read enough to understand the law, nor do we take the time like that young brother said to be well read and versed on said law so that we can know our rights, so we can't be violated. And we don't fight our court. Reason why a lot of us keep dying because of the situation, how they view us. And then we try to fight our court case right there on the side of the road. You fight it in court. And if you know the law and they don't, I say, you, you're going to illegally, illegally arrest me, please take me in. Because guess what? You're going to be a rich person. So it's on us to know the law, learn the law, understand the law, like that young man is saying. If I, I can agree. jump in and that's, one, that's one hold thing hold that hold I would like to time say. Out time out speakers. Time out speakers. We have a question from a student. Daryl? Hey, how y'all doing? My name is Daryl Larome, a uh, recent graduate of Morehouse College and Columbia University and previous DMSI, um, DMSI student um, and mentee. I think it... It, 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 even if we don't understand what the laws are, which it helps us, but it still doesn't help us in the end. As Kelly already said, we may not know the law, but the, the judges know the laws. And, and they still, these officers are still being like, it's, if it, if it's, a, it's a mental thing. If I know that it's okay, I'm going to be protected if, if I make a mistake as an officer. And it's not a mistake because I know the law. As an officer, I should know the law. I killed somebody and that, and it was not 
it wasn't it wasn't supported it it even with the law it shows that i'm wrong and with officers that get away with it as it continues to happen that's what the issue become that that's what the issue is because there you at, officer you're five right. years ago got away with it I'm a rookie coming in. I see that he got away with it, and I see he got away with it. So I know it's 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 going to happen for me if so, I do something. So, brother Daryl, let me ask you a question. Now, this is a black man talking to a black man. Let's skip all that. I'm a cop, and you know whatever you're cops do. I'm a more a Morehouse College graduate. Mm-hmm. I was I, when I was in college, I had an, I had a white officer point a gun in my face. I was approached by by five officers. He was the only one to point a gun directly. I mean, I'd done nothing wrong. So trust me, I understand. But we have to come home. You're a black man living in America, a system that was not designed for you, my friend. So you have to come home. So in order to come home, we we got to move different. They don't if if, if they you know they're out here to attack you. You can't move how white well, how white people move. It's simple as that. We don't live in that world. If that was the case, we would not be here. So what I'm saying is, it's imperative for your survival and my survival to say, you know what? I know he, I know this man want to kill me. I know I, I believe these certain things. I'm going to chill and I'm going to fight my case in court and then I'm going to sue his ass and then I'm going to do it that way since they don't understand, understand any other way. Because to fight your, your battle on the sidelines and say, well, the law, we know the law. We know it's not going to, in the end, especially if you die on the side of that road, that the law is not going to protect you then because they're going to paint your picture in a different light than what you already are. They're not going to say you were a college student. They want to say you were aggressive. So it's important that you understand that in order to survive. And I get that. And, and, and that's one thing that I would I would agree that you cannot at the time these incidents take place, that's not the time to try and fight because they're going to overwhelm you, you know, to his point, get the officer's name. All right. Go along, get arrested and then file your complaint, file the lawsuit, take them to the bank, you know, every and, and you, believe me. The burden of proof on a civil case is different than the burden of proof on a criminal case. So to, uh, just to, uh, uh, to, to clarify what you're saying, which I understand and agree, just making sure I understand. If you're in a situation where you have to let an officer unjustly do certain things, like you want to search my car versus me saying, no, you can't. I'm not giving no. you permission. Let them search it illegally. Let no, them no. do something illegal. Not saying that. You tell them no. no. If they, you tell them no if they violate your civil rights. Record, take notes, sue his ass. And that's where the issue comes in for me because it's once it's I tell you no that it's illegal for you to search my car, get out of the car. Now you're being aggressive. Now you're resisting arrest. That's where those other things. No, come no. In you at. let him. You record him and you let him search your car and you file a civil rights. You file a civil rights case against his ass and he violated your civil rights under the color of law. 1983, what, 241, 242 if somebody's with him. So you have to understand the law. And when you understand the law in that way, you know, sir, I told you, I didn't give you consent. You're violating my civil rights, sir. I'm got you on video. Go ahead. And if he's smart enough, he knows that you know the law. He's going to back off. You feel what I'm saying? I have a quick quick question, though. If the officer is the public servant, why do I need to know the law? Why do I need to be able to count off quotes and codes and know exactly what number dash? You don't, you don't have to count off quotes and codes. You need no, to know saying, just enough to protect your rights. You need you just, what he's but, saying but, is you need to know that if out, I pull time out, time out, time out, time out, time out. I understand I love what you're the energy, but we can't hear each other because we're talking over each other. Mm-hmm. So ask your rule. Back to you, bro. I just want to ask the question. What I'm saying is. One moment you're saying that we need to know the law so that if a police officer asks and does something that is an overreach, we can defend ourselves and say, no, you can't do that. Or no, I know my laws. I know my rights. How many YouTube videos have you seen where people start off a traffic stop that same way and end up either dead, violated? It escalates. And so the thing is, it goes back to the defunding the police, not necessarily training them on how to be anti-racist, but really clearly defining where, where where does your authority start and stop? Because we're calling police for things that they don't need to be called for. They're encroaching on people for things that they don't need to be encroaching on. And so the police are, there's a culture where police 
are, are engaging with us in, in a way that's antagonistic. And the only way for us to get out of it is to know what we're talking about. And you can't always count on that. That's like telling a group of students, you should know these teachers are public servants, so you should know how they get trained, where they go to school. Students don't know all of that stuff. They listen to what the teacher tells them. And so what I'm saying is if you all are public servants, the, the accountability is on the public servant to be able to not violate and encroach the person that they're supposed to be protecting and serving, not the other way around where we're in, where we're somehow, we're, we're held to some stuff that we have to answer to you and we have to uh, potentially face consequences that are meted out by you when that's not your job. Your job is not to give us consequences. Your job is to either stop it proactively or, or detain someone who committed the crime, but your job isn't to punish the person. There's other people that do that. So I'm just saying, we have to be clear on what we're saying. You can't tell us to know the laws and know our rights, and at the same time, just listen to what the officer says to go home at that night. At night, we can't do both. And you, and the onus is on the the public servant to get in rhythm with the communities that they're serving. If you, if you're inexperienced, all these new and inexperienced t uh, teachers and all these new and inexperienced police officers, they get sent to the hood. They go to southeast. They standing in your schools as SROs. All the experienced cops, there's a couple mixed and mingled in there, but those are the ones we need. The ones who are, who are new to it, send them to the suburbs where there's low policing. The ones who are going to be put in our presence, they need to know what they're doing. They need to be in, they need to be in rhythm with the community that they're serving. And if they're not, then we gotta we, we need to get rid of them. But well, do you know why that is, sir? That's the problem. Let me ask you a question. Do you understand that the reason why they do that is a lack of accountability? Lack of accountability. That's a word. No, 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 no. Hear me out. That's the first hear me time out. I've heard this whole thing. No, no, no. That's the first hear me. time I've heard that word. Accountability. Accountability. He, he, hear me out. Hear me out. On both sides. Yeah, on of course, sides of, of course. Police. Now, now let me let me. Oh, 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 oh. Don't, don't over so, so let me so let me let y'all understand. I'm not. I'm. I'm not. I'm not him. I'm with you. I'm with my people. So understand. I'm here to educate. I'm not here to point a finger. I'm not here to say. I'm trying to educate you so we can educate as a community. The only way to have anybody um, anybody to give you what you're supposed to have is to understand. If you have a bad teacher and you don't know what the teachers are supposed to do, they're going to keep giving you bad teachers. Why do we keep getting the short end of the stick in the black community? We don't hold anybody accountable. We don't hold our law, our lawmakers accountable. We don't, we, a lot of things that we, some people, they say go vote. I don't know if I believe in all of that, but what I'm saying is we, there has to be an accountability. Part of being, a, you holding people accountable is knowing what they're accountable for. I seen videos where I've had, I seen videos where I had a brother, I seen it the other day. He was outside of a courthouse. He had a gun on his hip. Uh, concealed, he had his concealed carry. He was a he was a photographer. A lot of these deputy sheriffs approached him and asked him, asked him when he was outside of a county courthouse. He said it's legal, and he started quoting the law. And they all looked stupid because he knew what he was talking about. Should he have to do that? No. But guess what? You live in America. Yeah, you got to do that. Hey, hey Brian. You live in America, sir. Is somebody walk into the store to buy. Hey, time, a out, time, out, time out. Time out. Time out. Time out. Hey, Dub. 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 Real quick. Not have to worry if they're walking fast. Or walk uh, too slow, You're right? Or if they should cross the street, if then walk past the wrong house, like we, All you right. guys are dancing hey, around the this. real blue elephant in the room. It's not the police; it's called racism. So and, let's get to that. Time and, out. And, 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 and a twenty dollars fake bill being called by an employee, and the police being weaponized because this is not just white people who do this to black men and women. Black people do it to black people as well. There needs to be accountability on the, there has to be real consequences for citizens and police right. who weaponize exactly. the police. Exactly. Period. Let's stop right That's there, it. guys. Let's stop right there. I love, this, this is, this is an incredible conversation because again, it's flowing right in line with the theme. Our next conversation as we begin to wrap this thing up uh, is the theme of do you believe we can live in an America absence of racism? No. Do you believe we can live in an America where racism does not exist? Impossible. And I thought of no one better than a very good friend of mine. He's my OG. His name is David Miller. He's an international speaker. He's an educator and an author. David Miller, lead us in this conversation. Can we exist in America 
absence mm. of racism. David Miller. Uh, good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Sure. So the answer is hell no. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, appreciative to be invited to the conversation. So ladies and gentlemen, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but even if you, even if you started police officers off at $200,000 a year, extended the police academy for another 24 months, it would not end the fact that um, we're at war. Uh, white people are classically conditioned to believe that they rule the world and that black and brown people are here to clean up after. And so, and so we gotta be real clear on a couple of things. And, and, I'm, and I'm gonna give you some things that I think we have to do as, as black people. Um, one of the books that I would love, and I love the young brother who said, we gotta read. One of the books that I would, that I would encourage everybody to read is called Faces at the Bottom of the Well by Derek Bell. Derek Bell was a Harvard trained um, lawyer. Uh, he ended up teaching at Harvard. And, and in his book, he talks about this notion that racism is as integral to America as breathing. So this whole notion that racism and white supremacy is gonna go away, uh, we're, we're, we're fooling ourselves. Um, there are a couple of things that I think that we need to consider. And then I'm gonna give you three things that I think that we need to do that I'm sure will continue to move this. It's right here. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Faces at the bottom of the well um, um, must read. One of the things that we have to do is, as a community, oftentimes our narrative and our messaging has to change, right? And the reason why I say that is because we often ask, I hear people say this all the time, what is wrong with Black people? That's the wrong question. The question is not what is wrong with Black people. The question is what has happened to us? And until, until we begin to change our messaging and, our change, and change our language, a lot of the things that will happen to us will continue to happen to us. One of the brothers said accountability, right? We need billboards in every city with the word accountability. Part of the challenge is, ladies and gentlemen, we don't keep our foot on the gas pedal. They talk about taking Aunt your mama off the thing and removing our Native American brother from the land of lakes butter and they sprinkle a little, they sprinkle around a little bit of money. Um, they make they at the last minute they make Juneteenth a state holiday or federal holiday, and we become complacent. So here's a couple of things that I think that we need to do. Number one, we need to take ownership of our own healing, right? Because the vast majority of black and brown people in America are so traumatized, we just haven't even realized it. And the conversation needs to move beyond trauma-informed to how do we create healing-centered homes? Because we talk a lot about what's happening outside of the home, but we need to focus the, focus the conversation on how do we create healing-centered homes, healing-centered schools, healing-centered communities, because the vast majority of us are so severely traumatized and so much stuff has happened to us. The brother, he was a police officer in Baltimore. When I was 19 years old, very quickly, I was a freshman at Morgan State University. My best friend at Mo was at Morehouse. He came home during summer vacation. We were standing in front of a nightclub. Three young men tried to rob us. We didn't have the money that they wanted. They shot my best friend in the back with a sawed off shotgun. I was 19 years old. When I was 10, one of my best friends blew his brains out in front of me playing a, a game called Russian Roulette. My story is very similar to the stories of most of the black men that I grew up with in Baltimore. That before we were even 20, 21 years old, we had already experienced multiple traumas and the healing was absent from the conversation. So we gotta take control over our own healing. The second thing is connected to that is ladies and gentlemen, we also have a pipeline issue. And when I say pipeline, and I'm just gonna name three professions, right? that we need to radically ensure that we're placing sober, responsible, critically conscious black men and women. We need more black clinicians. We can't keep relying on Becky for healing or Karen or whatever, whoever, Joshua, or whoever, whatever white person that you've been going to for healing. 
It ain't gonna work because they don't understand our community. Clinicians, um, um, educators, and black lawyers. Those are those are three areas that we have a pipeline issue that it is our moral and ethical responsibility to dramatically increase the number of black and brown people that go into those professions so we can take more ownership over our education and our healing. Two other things really quickly. Uh, the only way that I think our only uh, uh, tool, if you will, to chip away at racism and white supremacy is black excellence. And our goal as black men and women in this country is we got we to gotta move beyond being ghetto and, and bougie. You, you, you hear all of this nonsense. We, we got to move toward your black excellence. That's the way that we chip away at racism and white supremacy. Black excellence. Black people, are, in, in spite of all that we hear, there, 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 there are endless numbers of black men and women who are doing exceptional work. We got to amplify that because we're not going to see it on CNN. We're not going to see it on MSNBC. And when we talk about black excellence and Brother Heat, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Part of that is we got to open up our own damn schools, right? We got to open up our own schools. We got to support black businesses in ways that we never have before. We got we to gotta support HBCUs in ways that we have never supported HBCUs. HBCUs graduate more black engineers with PhDs, more black folks with medical degrees. So a lot of this is on us because white people are not going to change. You can give them a $200,000 salary as a police officer. You can train them for the next 36 months. It is not going to change our condition. No one is coming to save us. No one is coming to save us. We are the ones that our ancestors prayed for. It hey, is Dave, solely our responsibility. Hey, Dave, one of the guys in the chat asked you a good question. Please define really quickly what you mean by black excellence. Give some more context to that. Right. So black excellence is being the best at whatever we do. So if, so if you are sweeping a floor at Burger King, you are the best for floor sweeper. You go into the Hall of Fame for floor sweeping at Burger King. If you are a clinician, you are critically conscious, you are reading, you have multiple, you have mentors in multiple disciplines because you want to be the best clinician um, in your area. And so no matter what you do, you are excellent. And the goal is excellent. Mediocrity can no longer be the norm, y'all, in the black community. So and I'm and I'm gonna stop there. No, we're good. So really quickly, we have almost reached the end of our call, but we're not done yet. We have one more theme, and the theme that's coming up next is finding your voice in the movement. What are some takeaways, and Dave just gave us a couple, what are some takeaways we can begin to do as individuals to find our place in the movement? We have a couple of folks in that space going to speak to that. Before we do, any questions or comments from the group before we transition to our last topic? Yeah, yeah, I got one. I got yeah, one. I got one comment too. When y'all got comment. One sec. So, one, one quick second. Um, I want to sure? say this real quick. Hold on. Uh, Kelly brought up a point a moment ago about lack. And some of what David Miller just touched on exposes the idea that lack is prevalent throughout. And this this does come back. It's beyond races. Racism is a form of communication and a way of behavior. But how does it manifest itself is really important to understand, which is one of the reasons why the documentary 13th was so important and such an important watch. The 13th Amendment uh, to the U.S. Constitution, yes, it does ban slavery from a voluntary standpoint. But in terms of criminalization, it's very important to put that in context that all those Jim Crow laws in 1870 and beyond were instituted so that blacks could qualify for the second part of that clause, the criminalization clause of the 13th Amendment, because that still is a part of the economy. And sweep, creating a sweeping legislation like the Emancipation Proclamation, you have to understand that that meant a lot of the economy was also going away from people 
who saw black people as prey and part of their economic mobility and sustainability. So lack is very important and it still gets at uh, us today. And being part of something like the Financial Empowerment Center, it's very important to articulate when someone like David Miller says black excellence, black, black excellence shows up not just from a community standpoint, it shows up at the individual level, how we save, how we're praised on, how we're preyed upon from a consumer perspective. This week, we just showed the documentary from 1954 on how to sell to a Negro. If you want to go back and watch something, watch that 22 minute corporate American informational clip on how consumerism falls upon black Americans. And it's been a secret since the 1950s when blacks were starting to move into the middle class as families. So I wanted to add a little context because Kelly mentioned the key word there, which was lack and that economic deprivation is part of the disparity that plays out because let me tell you this, and this is my final point. When I was in, in, at the university in 2004, um, one of the things we studied was US police history and I was in a conservative part of America. And so I was like a little uh, fly on the wall listening in on this class. And one of the things that was revealed was that police, the institution of policing was not only meant to maintain slavery, it started before slavery. But the institution of policing was meant to sustain and maintain the status quo. And as long as the status quo is what it is, we need other actors and factors to create a new status quo. So when you hear the comment about defund the police, that's creating a new status quo. We need that line of thought and line of thinking as opposed to something else. So I'm gonna leave it there and I want the students to continue participating. Who's up? Very good. Hey, Brother Caron, you had a question, sir. Yeah, I had a, um, I kind of like a comment. Um, so, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Caron Su. I was in DMSI in 2015. Um, I wanted to kind of comment on the education aspect. Um, I, I don't know if anybody follows sports, but LeBron James opened a school in Ohio, it's called the I Promise School. And that school has like one of the dopest, I guess, programs or system I've heard of for any school. Um, because it's in a low income community, which is predominantly black, one of the things that it focuses on is it has one number one has a food bank. Uh, number two, it has some program that um, helps the, the parents get jobs if they don't have a job. I want to say every graduate of that I Promise School gets a full ride to Akron University. You know what I'm saying? Putting, put, putting programs like that in the most affected, you know what I'm saying, poverty stricken black communities around the world, like, I don't know, Southeast Baltimore, Watts and California, South, you know, South Central. If we do things like that, I think that could really just help the community from the inside. Cause like they were saying, I understand that, you know, it kind of makes you feel like we got to do, you know what I'm saying, more than them to help us when we didn't really put ourselves in a situation. But since we know that they really don't care to see us get better, you know what I'm saying, we got to take it upon ourselves to do something. And I feel like what LeBron is doing, if that could be like a nationwide thing, Programs like that is great because that's what that would that would be where the root is. Like if you fix the household, like you get the parent a job, they start bringing them more money. The household becomes better. Like I think that that will help. Great comment, man. Great comment. I appreciate it, Karan. All right, let's move ahead, guys. Uh, in, in the absence of time, the next comment, the next thing talks about finding your voice in the movement. One of the things I've talked about, we talked about in the last town hall call, was the protest is sexy. I see a bunch of folks going out. I actually went down to the protest with Heath Miller. I mean, with uh, Brother Heath Carelock. We went down and you saw people taking uh, pictures of the Black Lives Matter Boulevard and you see people posting on Instagram. Sometimes I think we stop at the Instagram post. We went down there, we did these things, but on the last call we had, all the students kept asking, Heath, Carelock, how do we find our voice in the movement? What are some takeaways? What are some action steps? Now, we have about three or four people that want to speak to this space. I want to start off with a good friend of mine. Um, I'm introducing him because I met him around the same time I met uh, Gabriel Ben. He's an artist. He's an activist. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's an entertainer. He's an educator. Uh, he's a father. He's a, he's, 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 a, he's, a, he's a U Street mayor, the mayor of U Street, in my opinion, is so much more. But he's been a consistent force from the stage to the classroom in terms of activating people to change. And you see it in his art as well. With that being said, to start off this conversation, talking about finding your voice in the movement, let me introduce you guys, my good friend, Brother Wes Felton. Peace, peace. What's happening, everybody? How y'all feeling? Uh, good, good. My name is Wes Felton. Um, I basically like uh, just wanted to 
Um, I prepared something. Basically, I just want to read and share with you guys. Um, I think that can kind of touch on everything. So beyond Juneteenth 2020, breaking the cycle of change defined by the status quo. To my brothers and sisters in spirit, mind, race, and class, I come to you today from a place of love. There are some things we need to say, but most importantly, we need to know the right time so that way they're more likely to be heard. As the current phase of this rebellion comes to an end with victories, defeats, and backlash in the form of strange fruit hanging from trees, a new phase will begin to take form, which we must be ready for. We want to share some lessons from our history, uh, bring clarity to some things to watch out for, and I want to offer some tangible steps to vibrate even higher in order to redefine who decides what change we are all fighting for. In the midst of the latest waves of structural violence against those who look like us, from COVID-19 to the continued self-hate feud violence against each other, particularly against our sisters, youth, and gay brothers and sisters, there is no doubt that the murders of George, Brianna, Ahmad, and Rashad have awakened some things deep inside of us to the surprise of many in the US and around the world. This is a moment in history. And again, we see the black woman on the front lines, which also means they are likely to be the more targets of disrespect and violence. One of the most revolutionary things that can be done is to double down on defending black women and girls against violence perpetrated by anyone within and outside of our communities. While uprisings are nothing new, we remember that 60 years ago, similar energies were released and sustained for months in rebellions around the nation. Just like we see today, the powers that be then were shook by the passionate organized protests and responded with a mix of sticks in the name of law and order, AKA protect property and carrots via commissions, studies, promises, pledges, pledges of, of course, money for groups, individuals, businesses, and religious organizations in our communities to influence those whose voices, once again, were the loudest and got to define the meaning of change. And 60 years later, here we are, just like we see corporations adopt strategic communication diversity playbooks, when racism within their business is exposed, they fear losing customers. We are seeing similar playbooks used at the federal, state, and local levels in, in an attempt to manage this energy. We don't just mean the way corporate uh, media tries to spin the law enforcement-based divide and conquer tactic between protesters and looters, which with the current overflow of statements, apologies, and corporations and governments, many of which have an enabled gentrification of communities, now promising to throw billions of dollars, not reparations, to address institutional racism, some might believe that the time of real change has been won. Well, let me tell you something. I believe the complete opposite is true because one of the greatest threats to this movement is the attempt to literally commodify Black Lives Matter. In the months ahead, it will be critical that we keep our third eyes open on the slacktivist voices that are trying to lead. Those Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, slacktivist voices trying to lead who don't have a track record of putting in work in our communities and building an agreed upon basis of unity for what we are here fighting for. That includes the police. If you are not a police officer who has been fighting for justice before this moment, both vocally and verbally, you are just a vapors catcher in blue, okay? That's the difference. Be we've been there, we've done that. As black men, as fathers, as brothers, as artists, as police officers, we've continued to do what we've always done and struggle as a way of life. We create our arts with open minds. We try to soothe the spirits. We put food on our community's tables and empower the next generation to find their voices, to define their futures and struggle for it. As the next phase begins, we urge communities. I urge all of you, I urge all of you, <laughs> all of you to continue to be vocal, continue to be locally focused, vote, vote to see, vote and support local small businesses who invest in your communities and build connections with others more that engage, engage your youth, 
Engage your youth. Meet them where they are. Stop trying to uh, project yourself upon them. Meet them where they are. It's their future and realities that we're fighting for. That's what this struggle is about. Here, culture is a key and given so much commodified, self-hating cultural expression is feeding our youth, supporting independent creatives in all forms as alternatives to non-self-hating ways of expression is going to be an even more valuable tactic in keeping the current vibration higher. Racism is not the result of a few prejudiced people. Mm -hmm. Institutional racism is a conscious policy of divide and conquer that is as old as civilization. Racism keeps us divided, so we do not, we do not tackle income inequalities, we put, we, which puts governments in immense power in the hand of a few billionaires who benefit financially from global warming and health pandemics and, and veto any effort to stop the destruction of life and the planet. We must decide to either end racism or we let racism end us because there is only one future for all the world's people. And that future is us standing united. If we change our racist way and unite to save the planet, we will continue to live on this planet together. If we continue to down the divisive, down the divisive paths of racism, the earth will become unlivable and our children and grandchildren will die together. Clearly, the 1% and their junior partners have made their choice. Now is the time for the 99% rest of us to choose our future. Humanity will be united in life or united in death. My name is Wes Felton. Thank you. Please push forward. Your voice matters. Do not let anyone control your narrative. If you need to just take your babies outside in your backyard and y'all walk around in circles in the backyard with signs that they create that say Black Lives Matter, that say, say her name, then you can be part of it. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to wait for someone to give you permission to be a part of the movement. Now, the last thing I will say, you don't even have to read a book. One of the most powerful things I ever saw was the color purple. See, sometimes you gotta break things in the most basic simple. Every day when that black girl came home from school because she was favored, because maybe she was considered the prettier of the sisters, she got to go learn and got to go to school. But every day she came home and she put stickers and signs all over the house. And she began to walk her sister who did not have the opportunity and would teach her everything that she learned. That didn't take a book, that didn't take a degree, that didn't take anything, but simply the very thing that was stolen from us. And that is our ability to connect our lineage and our history amongst each other to pass it on. We, we, at some point, we decided that we needed permission to pass on information through our generations. The time has come, it's 2020 y'all, the year of clear vision. And I implore and I challenge everyone to please take control as like Mac, Auntie Maxine would say, reclaim her time, reclaim your narrative. We are not descendants of Africans, we're descendants of the strongest of the strongest of the strongest Africans because the, the things that they went through even before they got to the castles and the dungeons and the boats, the things that they had to survive even before the narratives that only some of us know. I agree with that brother. Black excellence is beyond just a fancy car or a big house or black as fuck. Black excellence is actually uh, knowing your strengths and your weaknesses and doing whatever you can to feed and suppress the stronger or the weaker of those qualities of you. We are on this earth to be examples for everybody, not just anybody, everybody. That's, that, that's what I had. That's what I wanted to share with you guys. Um, I, I, I thank the police officers for what they were speaking on earlier. I don't know a police officer on the planet that would ever let a black man videotape him while he goes through his, uh, car illegally. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's in Mars or space or something, 
but I know nowhere on this planet where they will let you do that um, because we have even seen videos already where people have ended up with a busted head or broken rib or, uh, uh, you know, we just most recently saw a brother that was standing outside waiting for a Western Union from his sister. A black man that's a police officer was helping this man or not helping him, pursuing him because he was a suspect. The man said, hey, I, I'm just waiting for a Western Union. Then along pulls up other police officers and they immediately tackle this man and break his rib. The black man, black police officer continued to stand there with his body cam capturing all this and didn't allow it to be even diffused. He set it up, man. He set it up. That's what I... And, and so that's what we're talking about. If, if, if you understand good and bad on Harry Potter, if you understand good and bad on Star Wars, if you understand good and bad in, uh, you know, uh, the Medea movies, then you should understand... The, 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 that you are on the wrong side of history right now. If you are justifying or defending the behavior and as well as the history of the behavior of the police and racism is the reason. I just recently found out I have a, I had a 16 a year old son now who at 11 years old, his own black mother called the police on him simply because she didn't want to deal with him. That's the weaponizing of police. That's using police for sheer intimidation when you don't want to function like a human being. Sorry guys, part of the thing about being humans, you unfortunately got to deal with other people. Quarantining is a luxury, folks. You're not in jail. You're at home with, with Netflix and, 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 and the internet. So, 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 we have to, we, so, so we have to sometimes go back to the basics. One plus one equals two. It's not always about being the, the most uh, uh, educated or the most. That's, that's what has caused the disconnection. Because our educated often become elitist and they then ultimately choose the side of the aristocrats where they pick and choose like white liberal people when they want to acknowledge racism and when they don't want to acknowledge racism because they can pay their bills ain't nobody bothering them and their state they feel comfortable thank you Doug. i appreciate you bro one of the things i, I want to piggyback on something you just said <clears throat> is what role are you playing actively changing the narrative. One thing I realized that can't be done, I asked my father a question at the beginning of the George Floyd situation. I said, Dad, I'm sick of this. I'm tired of this. Every week is another fucking hashtag. He says, son, it's not going to change until white hearts soften. Oh, oh, I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to hear that. I hung up the phone my dad. I went off because this is me. I'm active driven. If you know me, I'm about action. I'm not about sitting back and talking. Yeah. A lot of us, including students on this call, and we're the social media world, we've become, we start, this is what I say. Social media is good for awareness, but it does have a stop and start. After you've gotten the awareness, you need to find some place to take action. There you go. You need to do something to examine your own personal biases. How are you dealing with people in your circle? Once you're able to look at that, you begin to extend yourself to your community. This was funny. You complain about cops in your community treating people unfairly, but you don't mentor your own community. You even go visit your own child at their school. I used to go to Riverdale Bay. We've never seen a father come in here. Mm. I said, really? They said, no, normally it's moms and grandmothers. Mm -hmm. The fathers only come when it's time for the discipline. Yeah. You're coming up every Friday, and I became a surrogate father. I, the kids didn't have fathers in the room. I had one kid on one lap, one kid here, and I became the surrogate father of the room. But guess what? That gives me the ability to have influence in my community, influence in my community, and shaping these young lives. Thank you, Doug. Hey, Doug, do you have that manifesto you can share? Can you share that? Yeah, I will. 
Okay, next one, next on the roster, man. I got to introduce my guy. We're, 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 we're getting into it. This next person coming up is my OG. Um, he's been a, a, a DMSI mentor from the very beginning. He just wrote a book. I'm going to let him talk about his book he just wrote. Welcome to the conversation, Brother Reginald Williams. Clap it up for him, guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, first of all, be heat, man, as always, man. Much love, man. Always want to get with you and do do the work that we do. Um, for everyone who is who's spoken thus far, truly appreciate everything that you said. You've you've back poured into me. Uh, actually, everything has really been said, so I don't know how much more I can really add to this thing. Uh, there's a thing that I always do prior to speaking. I either do it uh, privately within myself or I, sometimes I do it publicly. And I'm going to do this publicly today. Uh, first of all, um, standing on the shoulders of the ancestors because right now their blood is crying out and they're asking us to do what we need to do. Uh, so that, that's one. But I have recently just started also when I talk about the ancestors. Uh, this is a selfish moment. So just give me, you know, just bear with me uh, to also uh, I, I now speak on behalf of my brothers. Um, I buried my older brother yesterday. And for the last week, I've been home taking my younger brother to chemo because he has glioblastoma. So they've given him 12 to 18 months to live. So every time I speak now, I definitely want to lift up my older brother, Jerry, and my younger brother, Rodney, man. Much love to them. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> I don't want to be dismissive of our, our Native American brothers, our, our indigenous brothers, but if, if we look at 1866, uh, the first race riot revolved around a white police officer uh, brutalizing a black soldier who had come home. And I don't really remember what the case was, but if you look at 1866 Memphis riots, so we're talking about 154 years later and we're still dealing with the same situation. Um, more specifically, this, this I, I speak specifically for, for about this George Floyd situation. Um, and, and again, not to be dismissive of anyone else over time, but again, th this George Floyd situation, it, 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 it impacted me a little differently. And it may be as a result of uh, me having written the book. Hold on one second. That's the book, the Marginalized Voice. You'll see, you know, the whole thing. But anyway, this man, for eight minutes and 46 seconds, a police officer who represented what I call a persistent movement, comfortably kneeled on his neck. And during this almost nine minutes in length, George Floyd said, I can't breathe. He said, my stomach hurts. He said, my back hurts. He even said, everything hurts. And at one point, he called for his deceased mother. And that, that knee on his neck is a system, it's a movement that refused to hear his voice and refused to hear his cry. That's kind of the reason why I wrote way before this happened, a marginalized voice, right? He had no voice, he was marginalized. And what we have is we have this system of inertia where something is moving in the direction and it will continue moving in that direction until a greater force comes and stops it. So what is that, that eternal voice? our force. It is our voice. And I love the way Wes said it, man. It, it, it ain't complicated, man. It's something simple as speaking. And if it means I have to get in my yard and, and, and walk around with my own sign speaking, we have this situation where uh, a lot of people do not use their voice because of laugh, a lack of self-esteem or a lack of confidence or a lack of hope or just not believing that anyone will listen to them. But like Wes said, we got to reclaim our time. We have got to speak out against the systems that exist and do not care who is not listening. Because I'm telling you, as long as you are speaking, you will be heard, right? There's, you know, we, we heard the saying, uh, I guess the, I heard it before this, but many people, the first time they heard this thing was in, uh, what's the movie? Wakanda, Black Panther. It says the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Right. And so we, we have to get to the situation where we have to understand what we have to say is important. We have to we have to, you know, my boy, David, I, I know David well, and I hate I had to come behind David. But he, he spoke about uh, being responsible for our own healing. We, 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 we've got to take responsibility for our own healing. And he talked about black excellence or he talked about having 
having clinicians. Uh, in the book I wrote about, one of my chapters was called Treadmill Therapy. And it talks about a system of therapists who do not understand our young black boys. And it also, and, and it wasn't just, it wasn't just white folks who didn't understand it. Many times I run into therapy or therapists who have no idea how to deal with our young black boys or black folks because they're living in a Eurocentric or they, they move about in a Eurocentric paradigm. So the thing that I, I the thing that I stress more than anything else, I've been saying it for 18 years in terms of working with young black boys and, 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 and folks, ladies, the only reason why I keep saying young black boys is because I feel like there's, there's a movement out there that speaks to every other group of people and there isn't a movement out there that speaks to young black boys, right? Um, the thing that I've always said, you are young geniuses. You are young kings. I get young kings from Be Heat, right? Stand up. And, and have your voice be heard. It does not matter who does not agree with what it is that you say. Just stand up and speak. Wes, uh, Wes, Wes, Wes posted something a while ago, and, and hopefully he might be able to remind me exactly what it is, but he posted something as it related to his art and people not accepting his art the way they accept other things. And I think he asked the question as whether or not uh, he should continue to, do an, to continue doing the art. And I, I meant to respond and I didn't. Hell yeah, because Wes, and as we just heard, Wes's voice is important, right? And so the only thing I said, in, in order to us, in order for us to hear our voice, we just gotta have the courage to speak. And we don't have to, we should not care about who agrees or disagrees with what we said. When I wrote the book, I already knew I was gonna get pushback from a lot of people. But I don't care whether or not they agree or disagree with what they say. What, what that book is going to do is going to, it's going to cause you to have a conversation. And if you don't have a conversation, then that will prove to me that you have no, you, you care nothing about the clients that I'm speaking to or the, or the population I'm speaking to. So, you know, I'm going to be real brief or I'm, I'm done. Like, you know, I, I, I go back to what Wes says. It ain't complicated, man. Get up, speak. If it ain't nothing but in your yard but get up and speak. I hope I said something that made some sense. Thank you, thank you, Reg. One of the things I love about you, sir, is that your whole life has been aligned with the book. The, your whole life has been aligned with what you're talking about right now. Um, our next person to talk about their role in the movement is a, is a near and dear friend, uh, their family, to be, to be honest with you, and some little bit of bias about them. Uh, her name is Tamara Torbert. I want to make sure she got a brand new uh, position here in the DMV area. And she made very clear that I have to make sure that I say this position uh, correctly. Uh, that, that I get her title correctly. So the name of her position that she holds now is called AVP of Learning and Development Professional for the Greater Washington and Greater Maryland area. With that being said, welcome to the line, uh, Tamara Torbert, to talk about um, finding your voice in the movement and how you become active in the space. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate uh, being here today. Um, a lot of things have already been said. So there are some things that I've prepared that really will help me, that have helped me resonate and capitalize on the energy that you've all given me about finding your voice. Key ideas of Black excellence. Key ideas of going back to the basics. Being courageous. So how do you find your voice? when we're listening to countless stories. We are the historically disenfranchised. Stand on these shoulders, right, of others. But for those progressive clauses that right now, many in the world think will always be there, right? Things like civil rights. There are too many platforms. There are more platforms that are coming around that will allow us to join the cause, but I'm going to challenge y'all today to think about what is the right cause for you? Because we all have a voice right now, okay? We all have a voice, but in what direction are we shouting that invokes impact and action? So brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you to not be afraid, but be empowered and be curious right now. I want to engage with you with a conversation today that is about giving us all an opportunity to pause for a moment, set aside time and focus on what it is that we do best. 
Do you know that the impact of what you do best each day has on business, working in your strengths, working in your zones, right? Um, I'm talking about those innate abilities, those behaviors and characteristics that um, no one taught you how to do, right? They just invoke from your spirit. Because when they invoke in that type of in that type of energy in that that type of way, there is an attraction that makes you move towards action. You get to speak in a language, a way that you can articulate to get into the room when you are in a room to be heard about what it is that you do best and supporting ways to find opportunities to leverage that throughout our communities. So first and foremost, we need to be more aware of ourselves, ladies and gentlemen. We need to become that much more appreciative of the unique strengths that each one of us has in order to grow um, our strengths. We not only have to show them, but we also have to listen. You have to open the door to be heard. I'm talking again about natural reoccurring patterns of thoughts and feelings and behaviors that you have already shown in your existence that have been productively applied. That when you put them in a move forward, we all have these innate abilities, but how many times have we decided that we are going to transform these talents into strengths, into weapons, into things that we use to actually fight the movement. So once again, as you are searching for your voice, I'm going to encourage all of you not to be afraid, but be empowered and be courageous. Ask yourself questions daily, because there's a lot of things going around, and I could be a protester, I could be in my backyard, I could write a book, I could speak eloquently to someone else, but I need to find out the one that's going to magnetize my action for impact. So you ask yourself, what do I know about myself? What do I learn about myself? In this movement, what is striking me in a moment where I immediately jump up to move? Next, you ask yourself, so what? This is where you tap into that genius that Brother Williams was just talking about. What does it mean for me to literally sit down and tap into, intentionally tap into what I know I do well, leverage that most effectively, saying out loud, this is what I'm doing with my voice. And then you say to yourself, well, what now? I need to take action. I believe in writing that down. Is it about writing a letter to the Kentucky legislation saying arrest the police who have murdered Breonna Taylor? Friends, it is all about ensuring that you engage, that you are working within your strength zone. Let me tell you something, when you know that you're moving in the right space, you look forward to doing the work that needs to be done. You're attracted to it. You have a more positive than negative interactions with those who need to be sitting at the table with you. You tell your friends, your family, and your coworkers about the work you're doing because it means something to you. That is pouring into your community. And friends, you achieve more on a daily basis while you are creating and being that much more innovative. Right now, it feels real conditioned to minimalize how our beautiful blackness, our voice. But I'll just leave you with don't be afraid, ladies and gentlemen. It is about being courageous and empowered about what you bring to the table, but do you know what that is? Find that voice and mobilize in that direction. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And, and, and unfortunately, guys, and I hope you guys were able to hear, I know the connection was coming in and out. Tam Tamara just gave you some really good jewels. Number one, I'll say this to you, and I, we have a couple of people coming up next, but I have to make sure you, I amplify what she just said. Everybody's role in the movement is not the same. I may not necessarily be a frontline protester throwing Molotov cocktails in a police precinct. That's not the way I do what I do. I may be the person that writes the book. I may be the person that 
um, rallies my staff to have a great conversation at lunch about what they're feeling and checking on their mental wellness. There's so many things you could be doing, but just like Tamara talked about, what are the things you want to do that connect to who you are? If you're attracted to politics, get involved in local politics. If you want to go mentor to school, go mentor to school. Do not feel like you have to do something that's out of your, your wheelhouse versus something that's more natural to you. Also, and I'm going to add this as we go to our next person. As you're finding your voice in the movement, make sure it's something you can, you can sustain. This is very heavy conversation, race relation, violence, death, incarceration, systemic racism, um, white supremacy. That's a conversation that can weigh you down and you can't have that every single day. So I tell people, what is your mental health outlet? Your emotional health outlet. Me, it's the gym. Me, it's music. Me, it's talking to a good friend where I can bring myself down, refill to fight a good fight the next day. So no matter what you do, I want you to make sure you keep yourself filled up, mind, body, and spirit to fight that good fight daily. Uh, with that being said, it's transition. We have a great person coming up uh, next. I met her a few years ago, and uh, she was working at the time doing some PR work with a company called Median out of, I do believe, Alexandria or Arlington, Virginia. But she's a dynamo when it comes to uh, entertainment consulting for organizations. And she's going to come in and give her voice on what you could be doing again with a new perspective on finding your voice in the movement. Please introduce and welcome to the line, Ms. B. Clark. Clap it up, guys. What's going on, everybody? What's going on? Um, everybody's been fantastic. It's been about two hours that we've been locked into this. So I'm I'm excited to, to really talk to you all about just this topic. It's, it's, it's so interesting to see everyone here. Uh, we got about 57 people in the chat. So we're going to just jump right into it. Um, let's get some active, let's get some activity going. Put in the chat a number one if you felt like you're an activist within these last two weeks. Put a one in the chat. Put in the chat. A one in the chat if you feel like you've been an activist for these last two weeks. That you've been, you know, you've been going hard, you've been doing your thing, it's been, you've been pounding it. Okay, we got some ones in the chat. It's going. Okay, okay. That's good. That's good. That's fantastic. I see it. I see it. I see it. So check this out. It's imperative to understand what activists really mean. If you really, if you really channel in on what that really truly means, anybody ever heard of the, the boycott? The uh the the bus the bus boycott. Yes. 381 days straight. 381 days straight. That individual boycotted the bus. So a lot of these individuals is everybody is saying. How, how, what's your bandwidth? What's your strengths, right? How are you really being an activist, right? Well, what is that, that gift, that thing that you have inside of you that, that you can at least, right? So I'm gonna give you three things because I'm someone that, lo that loves the tactics behind things, love the tactics. So the three things that I, that I, I want to uh, come to you all uh, up front with is, um, are you asking the right questions? And not only are you asking the right questions, but who are you asking those questions to, right? Who are you asking those questions to? It's cute to ask your boy, oh, I think we should go, so we should go lewd. Oh, oh, I'm gonna ask my homegirl, what you think we should do? But are you asking the experts? Are you asking the people who've been in the trenches, who've done the work, who's done the research, who's done all of these extra, extra things that are going on, have you done that research? Have you been to a, 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 an urban lead um, chapter, right? To see how can you bring, bring your gifts up front? Have you been to an NC, uh, NAACP um, uh, movement? Have you been to those things? Have you um, researched Tamika Maori? Have you researched Sean King? Those individuals who are truly in the trenches and, and email and maybe not them specifically, their organization say, how can I get involved with you? How can I be in touch with you, right? That's number one. So are you asking the right questions to the expert? Number two, integrity over optics. I think we all mentioned it. It's so cute to post a black, uh, black box. It's so cute to post things on Instagram. However, it's important to really be integral of the things that you're putting out. 
Now, if you're not, you know, powder to the people, if you're not the one to say, you know what, uh, I want to tweet all day. If that's not you, that's okay. And I, I want to make that very um, clear that it's okay that you don't want to post something on Instagram. It's okay, right? It's okay that you don't want to have the, the, the conversation with, um, with the people that surround you. It's okay. There's other ways that you can do that. You can say, you know what, I'm, I'm to myself, I'm going to ensure that I, I spend the black dollar only in the black, in, in black, in black businesses, right? Or I'm only going to go to this specific doctor because they're, they're within my community, or I'm only going to spend this type of money. So those are the things that you can really do to change the needle within your community. Number three, um, Ms. Tammy, you truly, you, you touched on it, bringing your superpower. Brian, you always talk about this too. What is that superpower in you? What is that? What is that? And bring it to the table. So giving you an example of what that means, bringing it to the table. Let's say I'm a graphic designer. I'm a graphic designer and I know that this activist, this individual who is truly doing the legwork, truly doing um, the, the, the power to the people, the, the, the talking and things of that nature, I know that's not my lane, but I know I'm a graphic design. Let me go to him and say, you know what? I'm going to do all of your graphic design for free because I support you. I support what you're doing. That's how you can truly leave your legacy. If that, if, if voicing your opinion is not, again, if voicing your opinion is not in your bandwidth, it's okay. If you are a, if you are someone who is an organizer, or if you're someone who, um, that knows somebody that can connect somebody to another resource, do that and do it pro bono. Do it for the love of the mission. Do it for, you know what, you know what? No one's looking at me for any praises. No one's looking for any type of optics but I'm doing it because I, I really truly feel the mission, right? And that's the key. Again, integrity over the optics, integrity over the optics. You know what I'm saying? So those are the three things. Again, one, asking the right questions to the experts. Two, integrity over optics. Three, bringing your superpower to that true activist, that true organization. Again, I'm pretty sure we have, there's plenty of individuals in here that are fantastic at something. If that's graphic design, if that's web design, if that's PR, if that's marketing, say, you know what? I'm going to do the marketing for free. I want to amplify you. I want to be your, your barrier. I want to be your, if you're the warrior, I want to protect our warriors. And that's the thing. That's the energy you have to bring when it comes to voicing um, and how you can truly be um, an individual in the community. Of, and you're not sure exactly what to voice and what to say. It's okay to not know what to say. It's better to sit back and listen and to, to, to prematurely say something that you have no recollection about. So it's important to understand that. Research research these things first. Say, you know what? I'm going to sit out. I'm going I'm to sit out this particular conversation because I want to listen. I want to listen to the experts. I want to listen to the people around me who probably know a little bit more and say, you know what? This is how I can position myself to help that warrior, to help that activist, to help that individual. So I challenge each and every one of you, truly, 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 we got some ones in the chat. If you're saying that you're an activist, okay, okay. We, 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 okay. I'm, 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 I'm ready. I'm ready to see the, the graphic designers out there, the, 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 the individuals who have these superpowers, these skills, that they can amplify the true individuals that's really about this life. Because if you're saying you're about this life, again, 381 days, woo, try to do something like that. Try to do something like that. That's, that's a whole nother level. That's a whole nother level. So I don't want to keep barking at y'all. Again, we've been in here for about two hours. Uh, again, I'm, I'm visual, so I, I love the, the, the list that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you guys. So number one, no, understanding what type of questions and who are the experts, finding those experts. Number two, in, uh, integrity over optics. Number three, bringing your superpowers to the table to the true activists, to the true people who are on the front lines. Peace, good people. Thank you so much, B. And, and you know what's so funny? <clears throat> That's the energy queen I was looking for. That's the energy right there. We need it right there. I appreciate that, Queen. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, it's funny that, that I'm gonna give you a quick example. We don't have much time, we're about to wrap up. 
is that um, from the time of George Floyd till now, a couple of people have asked me, Brian, why aren't you speaking? Where are the videos from you, Brian, speaking? I said, and my response to somebody when they said that was, I have been speaking. I've switched how I've done it. I, I tapped into becoming an educator and a curator. So what I did was, I was already doing, this was so fun. I'll give you a quick example. I'm so sorry. I had a white guy I used to work with years ago. He's, he's a pretty smart guy. He's on my social media. George Floyd gets killed. All this protest, protest starts, starts happening. And he hits me on Facebook and says, Brian, what are you going to do? And I'm like, first of all, you can't come at me in any way tell me what am I going to do. And I don't know your cloth or your pedigree. My first response was, I've been in these trenches. When these protests die down, I'm going to still be in these trenches. I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to empower my people to handle the marathon we have coming up. And sometimes it's not needed for me to get on my microphone and be off the raw, raw motivation. It becomes informing them on the context of wording being used, Inform informing them on cases, doing town halls, sharing information about hidden history. I've been dropping some hidden history lately to empower our people to step into our next chapter. Because ladies and gentlemen, our next chapter does not involve everyone else changing, but us remaining the same. Our next chapter does not involve everyone else changing, but black people remaining the same. So again, my voice in the movement changed from speaker to curator, from speaker to educator. And you can find different ways to find yourself in the movement. With that being said, we have maybe one more person or two more people left, but I think my guy John is on the call. Brother John, are you there? I am, sir. Uh, good afternoon and blessings to everybody. I apologize for my tardiness. Um, for those of you that I've had a chance to interact with, it's very good to see uh, your wonderful and God-given faces. And again, I apologize for my tardiness. We've been doing a lot of work here in the city of Minneapolis. We just got it approved on the docket literally today, like maybe an hour ago or so, where we are going to fast track a plan to uh, work with the city of Minneapolis and get it on the ballot for November regarding defunding the police and putting in different safety precautions and safety measures here. So if that gets approved, it'll be on the ballot in November. So that's I'm where I was. who you are though, Champ, some of these guys didn't meet you on the last call. Yes, sir. Um, my name is John Nehemiah Harper. I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for South Central College, located in Mankato, Minnesota. Um, George Floyd was actually killed in my neighborhood on 38th and Chicago. I grew up on 40th and Clinton, so this topic is near and dear to my heart. Uh, Brian Heat and I connected over the Male Minority Institute in 2017, and we've been rocking together uh, ever since. So that just gives you a little bit about me and some of the things that I'm doing here in the great state of Minnesota. Very good, man. Now, very quickly, man, kind of give us, you're on the ground. You know, you and I have been talking, you'll send me videos. What are some things right now a person can do as we start to wrap this town hall up? There's been so many ideas dropped on us, so many jewels. From your perspective, being on the ground floor and also working with young people, what are some things we could be doing right now to be actively a part of the conversation? Man, so I actually just typed something out in the group chat, uh, group chat about racial battle fatigue, right? Because it's real, right? Racial battle fatigue is a real thing. And one of the things that I said, um, especially working with my young men of color and my young women of color, is that you need healthy outlets, right? You need to recharge because this is not a sprint, right? I'm pretty sure that's been said multiple times during this conversation. This ain't a sprint. This ain't a 5K. This ain't the Boston Marathon. We're talking about life, right? We're going to be doing this work for the rest of our lives. One of the things that you need to do um, as a person of color is shift your focus to creating generational equity, right? It's one of the things like I'm trying to hammer into my young students' hearts and minds and even working with faculty and staff. Generational equity equity, right? You've heard people talk about generational wealth, right? I'm trying to get this concept of generational equity into people, but because this is a long fight and because it feels like it's an uphill battle, you got to recharge. You got to fuel, right? Because there are going to be times where you're like, man, bump it, right? Like I'm going to let somebody else do the work and you can't do that, right? Don't quit. Recharge. You need to find healthy outlets that can refuel you mentally, right? something that you can like not deviate away from this conversation. And that's not what I'm trying to say, not deviate away from this conversation, but something to help 
shift your focus to keep it on there, right? Simon Sinek did a book, uh, Start With Why, and there's some very good points from that. But don't quit, redirect. Don't quit, refuel. Collaborate, right? So if you're a person out here wondering like, okay, what do I do when I uh, get involved? One of the things I talked about last time is that it is up to you. It is your personal responsibility to be that person in your family, in your community, and especially in your immediate sphere of influence, right? Because everybody has a sphere of influence, whether it's a sphere of influence in your friend, a sphere of influence on your job, a sphere of influence on social media. It is your responsibility to be... Um, knowledgeable on the laws, the rules, and the regulations. I'm really big on voting on a uh, state and local level and different aspects like that. So for each and every one of you that have never heard me talk or never heard me speak, I challenge you, I beseech you, therefore, my brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, that you not only have work to do, you have a personal responsibility to everybody around you and yourself, right? a personal responsibility to yourself, right? When we talk about equity and we talk about legacy, two years, for, actually not even two years from now, six months from now, do you want to look back on the last six months and say like, I could have done more? That is the worst feeling that, uh, one of the worst feelings on the face of this planet. Like I should have, could have, would have. We don't have time for should have, could have, would have. If you're going to do or you're not going to do. So stay focused, recharge spiritually, recharge mentally, recharge physically because the fight that we got to fight is coming for generations to come right our parents tried to fight it right our grandparents tried to fight it our great grandparents trying to fight it right now everybody in this room and everybody that's on this call it's on us we got major work to do the trick of the enemy is to think that you are by yourself and at times it's going to feel like you're out there by yourself why am i the only one marching why am I the only one going to the voting polls? It's in times like those that you got to remember your why. It's times like those that you got to remember what God has placed on the inside of you to press forward, to tap in and to push forward because everybody has a different type of leadership style, right? You got to find like-minded people, but then I'd even challenge you to find some people that don't necessarily think like you because they can contribute to the overall goal that you and everybody else uh, right now that is on this call that are trying to accomplish. If you walk into a room and you're the smartest person in the room, you got a problem. I keep people like Brian Heat by me. Um, I keep people like... Um, all different types of people that I know by me that I consider friends and some of them that I consider mentors. Why? Because it's not about me getting to the level that they're trying to get. It's about them imparting knowledge and wisdom and then giving me a different perspective, right? Not just somebody to bounce ideas off of, but an individual that I can partner with, collaborate with, and then somebody who can challenge me and get in my face and drive me to be a better individual. John, real quick, a question about why in Minneapolis is the police funding like four out of every $10 of the public general fund? That's oh, man. So, um, because yeah. Because America is mostly like 4% instead of 40%. So why so high in Minneapolis? So what most people don't uh, know and quite understand is that the state of Minnesota was one of the hotspots for native and digital lands, right? And so when we talk about even before... Uh, Abraham Lincoln and his administration, you had the Oceanabe, you had the Dakota people, you had some Ojibwe, um, you had some Chickasaw people, right, that were in uh, the Midwest, the state of Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, down into Iowa, Illinois, and even certain places in Wisconsin. So what happened, um, and you'll I'm laughing at this question because I was, I was a political science major. Um, what happened is when Abraham Lincoln got reelected the second time, there was a governor by the name of Henry Sibley, right? And I tease my spouse because she went to Henry Sibley High School. He's the most notorious governor in the state of Minnesota. And in my opinion, he's one of the most notorious men um, in the United States ever. Him and Abraham Lincoln had a question because Abraham Lincoln barely won the state of Minnesota by like maybe a few thousand votes. And Abraham Lincoln asked, why did you, like, what happened? Like, you're up there, you know, we're running a campaign. Why didn't I win Minnesota by more? And he said, because you didn't allow me to lynch Native Americans. Henry Sibley is responsible for the largest mass lynching of Native Americans in United States history. Look it up if you think I'm lying. So part of uh, Governor Henry Sibley's policy was law and order, right, to enforce. And so those policies have been on the books since 19... I want to say they've been on the books since 1912, right? After Abraham Lincoln, but that's part of the reason. 
Another part of the reason is that the largest highway in the state of Minnesota, I-35, that highway wasn't actually designed for transportation. It was designed to separate the African-Americans and the white people. And to this day, if you drive in Minneapolis, you're going to see blacks pretty much on one side and whites on the other side. So part of the reason um, that the police have so much funding is because that's actually been in their foundation since going back to Abraham Lincoln. And that policy has never changed and it's never been challenged. Sharon Sales Belton, the first African-American woman of Minneapolis in 1990, what was that, 1994, 1995, she tried to challenge those laws, right? And she only ended up, I believe, getting uh, one term in the city of Minneapolis. So part of the reason that the money is going to the police is because lawmakers do not want to touch that. The police union in the state of Minnesota is so severely strong, it mirrors those of a police union that are in Arizona. Wow. That's a good question, He, Hey, yeah. guys, man, you know, you know, this was funny, John, and, and, and I'm going to end like this. We're going to close up right now. What I've realized is, and, I, and, I, and I'll frame it this way, everybody on the line, first of all, thank you so much. I think at our height, in terms of our room and attendance, we had about 100 people. That's almost double from the last call. So that's a great thing, man, we expanded. We have more presenters, so many jewels and information. But I, I'll share this. There was a video clip of George Floyd's daughter sitting on Stephen Jackson's shoulders, and he was spinning her around. And her, she put her arms up to the sky and said, my daddy changed the world. Now, I'm going to tell you, that hurt me and it inspired me. It hurt me because she was right, that her father was one of the reasons why this outbreak of consciousness for the Black plight started. But why it made me sad was she had to lose her father to see that happen. With that being said, you have to ask yourself, as a, as a community, as a people, how many of us are going to allow people that look just like us to, to continue to get killed and, and, and brutalized by a system designed to hurt us while you play the sidelines? While you play the sidelines. I would be in the barbershop not getting this cut up, but just this getting shaped up. And I'd be in the barbershop and... And I would hear people complain about black males don't do this and young black girls don't do that. I would interject and say, excuse me, do you mentor? No, nah, I ain't got time for that. Well, you can shut up then. If you're not a part of the solution, you're a part of the problem. So with that being said, we are living in unprecedented times where new possibilities are all around us. Surround yourself with positive people to see positive things occurring. I had a guy reach out to me recently. He was 70 years old. He's one of my father's friends. He called me 11 o'clock one night and said, Brian, that stuff you're posting on social media, them people gonna come and get you. I said, who? Who's coming to get me? That's that old way of thinking that you can't talk about the system. You can't talk about racism. You can't talk about these things because they're gonna come and get you. The boogeyman is gonna come and get you. Now, are some of these threats real? Absolutely. But I'm not that high profile in that space that my conversation is going to attract that. Look at Sean King, though. Sean King had death threats on his life from law enforcement because he's been an advocate for years on the highest platforms of police brutality, mass incarceration, and reforming policing. And he also kind of got in some hot water because he made a real controversy statement about taking all the pictures of Jesus Christ down all the statues, all the paintings. And I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back. That these people, you know, you can only go but so far before folks try to lean back at you. But my point being is, it's an unprecedented time for opportunity, for revolutionaries, for progressive thinking, for new opportunities. But what you can't do is be asleep at the world's biggest revolution. I always think like this, when my son gets older, and he looks at me and says, Daddy, what did you do when George Floyd died? Daddy, what did you do when Breonna Taylor died? Daddy, what did you do when they shot Rayshard Brooks in the back? What did you do, Daddy? And I'm too much of a man to look my son in the face and say, I ain't do shit. All I did is I sat back and I watched. That's not who I am. Those that know my, my pedigree and my cloth, I'm not built like that. So what I'll tell you is this, find something, your superpower, that V spoke to, that Tammy spoke to, 
find a superpower that's valuable right now in this space and give, give. Guys, my normal keynote is like 5,000 for the hour and that's real rap. I'm not, I'm, and guess what? They owe me more money to be, to be honest with you. But right now I'm doing speaking engagements, 50 bucks, a hundred dollars, I'll do a virtual. You know why? I'm a part of the movement. Why would I charge you 5,000? You say you don't have it, and now I can't add my voice to the movement. So I lowered my prices based upon certain organizations so I could be a part of that movement. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot complain about the struggles of this country and not be a part of the solution. Hey, Brian, real quick. Um, we actually have someone who is part of the solution, uh, Nick Charles, who's a state of Maryland delegate here, and I wanted them to get a chance to greet everyone and give a brief reflection. Right, I hit Nick. I thought he disappeared on me. I hit his phone, he didn't answer. Okay, come on, Nick. What's up, B? How's everything, brother? Good. Yeah, man, uh, this this was powerful, man. This was very, very powerful, uh, hearing everybody speak and uh, touch on some of the things that they can do. I, I put a couple of things inside of the chat throughout the entire time, uh, addressing some of the pieces about accountability, you know, and put in there as well the uh, website to go to and it was also reshared to find out who your county council members are and who your state delegates are like that is one of the most critical pieces of information you can have as we go on this journey to try to change police accountability measures you know in, in the state of Maryland for the first time we've elected an African American and a woman to be the speaker at a house and because of that, we now have someone in a position that looks at all of these issues through the lens that we look through. They're looking at it from the position as an African-American, as a black woman, as a black person in America. And that right there alone is gonna help us tremendously as we move to get a lot of these pieces of legislation across the board. This year, uh, she has set up a police accountability work group and there are meetings going on right now. I believe the next meeting is July 16th. And that's, uh, we need more people to show up and actually put their voices to use and let folks know what, you know, these are the things that I want to see change. Uh, you mentioned something earlier about the uh, Prince George's County Police Chief uh, no longer being there. He actually uh, stepped down. The county council, once uh, the county executive actually is going to be doing a search for a new police chief. When they do this search, she's going to nominate that person then it's gonna be up to the county council to vote on that nomination. You need to be actively engaged to know who your county council members are so that you can voice your opinion in this process and make sure we're not getting an officer who's gonna be in there who, who may not actually uh, believe in the same ideals that we believe in. And then we also need you to go onto that same website that I put up on this, on this uh, chat group and find out who your state legislators are because we start session in January. And this isn't a, a, a journey for the week. That's seven months from now. We gotta wait seven months until we get back into session. So we need you to find out who your legislators are and constantly communicate with them to tell them exactly what you want. That's a part of what a lot of these folks been saying today as far as open communication and holding yourself accountable and to hold other folks accountable. If you don't know who your county council member is, you're just complaining at the win and not complaining at the person that can actually make the change. If you're not finding out who your state legislators are, who your state senator is, you're just complaining at the win. You're not actually reaching out to the person and holding them accountable. Because guess what? In two years is the election to replace your county council members and your state delegates and your state senator. So if you're not stepping up to hold yourself accountable to know who these individuals are, you're already 10 steps behind. So you have the information. If you choose not to go to the website and find out who these folks are, shame on you. Shame on you. You can go out there, you can, you can march all day, you can do all of this all day, but if you're not talking to the right people to make the change, you're talking to the win. And so I wanna hold everybody in this chat accountable. I wish I had got to say this to the 100 plus people, but to the 49 folks in here, it's up to us. We have to be the service of change that we want to see. We have to be the individuals to step up and hold folks accountable. 
So I'm asking all of y'all, and if I'm your legislator, reach out to me. Tell me what you want to do. I, I, I've been having conversations. I've been on a lot of Zoom calls over the last couple of weeks uh, surrounding these issues. F folks, we need everybody to step up to the challenge. Thanks, B. Appreciate you, bro. And you know what? As we start to wrap up, guys, one thing I, I want to give Brother Nick, who's my frat brother, um, a compliment. Prior to Nick actually getting into office, he may not remember this conversation. At our old barbershop, we had the same barbershop. Nick began to tell me why he wanted to run for office. And I sat there and I listened to him. And what I heard from Nick, and I didn't get a chance to hear this from a lot of politicians that I had in my space, Nick genuinely cares about his community. Like as he's talking to me, he's talking about garbage trash being picked up and, and what this looked like and, the, and, and how his community looked. And it's, well, I said, wow, this is the type of brother that needs to be in office because he truly, truly cares about your community. So I'll end it here and I'll let Heath do a little housekeeping on the back end. I'll take something that, that Nick just said. You have to become the change you desire to see. You guys know how I am. I do not respect all talk, no action. I'm not impressed. I tell my colleagues who are motivational speakers, you're all stage speakers, but if I follow you back to your community, you're not doing anything in your community. You travel around the world, you speak, you hype people up, you get a bag of money, you go home, but you're not impacting those communities. Become the change you desire to see. So my last little tip before I let go is, for those who don't know, DMSI stands for the Diverse Male Student Initiative Program. This program at Prince George's has been around since 2009 under the leadership of a couple people, Dr. Charlene Dukes, who's been a phenomenal president for our campus, who is now retiring. So I love you, Dr. Dukes, Pittsburgh native. Dr. Dukes was the one who gave me the permission and the inspiration to build that program at Prince George's. When I first started, they had zero men in any programs like mine. 11 years later, my program, along with my mentors, we've serviced over 1,500 students in the areas of uh, career readiness, entrepreneurship readiness, manhood development and academic achievement, and now financial empowerment. I would not be able to do the job I'm doing without my dean, Dr. Foreman, without my direct supervisor, Dr. Charles Roosevelt, Roosevelt Charles. Guys, it takes a collective movement to get anything done. And this call couldn't have happened without you. With that being said, I thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for engaging and staying on the call as long as you did. Brother Heath, I'll let you close out. Any last remarks? And we'll go from there. Yes. Um, there's going to be two polls that, that launch. So I want you to take the final two minutes. Each poll is only going to take one minute. So quickly go ahead and answer these polls. Uh, this one will close in the next 30 seconds. And then we'll launch the last one, which is an evaluation poll. It's only two questions. So it's not very long. But I do want to thank... Uh, Marshall and Angela from PGCC TV, because you all are gonna coordinate the sort of amplification of this in the communication spaces. And that's important that the conversation doesn't stop here. It's also very important to continue engaging in what the college is doing, whether it's through DMSI or through PGCC TV or through the organization that I'm heading, which is the Financial Empowerment Center at Prince George's Community College, again, a project of the United Way. Everything we do at the center is free. And when it comes to money and finances, that's at the heart of a lot of this change. As was reflected in the documentary 13th, this comes down to economics. It costs more money to keep a person incarcerated for the average duration of time than it does to educate somebody from birth through 16, 18 years old. So it's very important to know about the investments, the average incarceration costing anywhere from 31 to $60,000 a year over a three year time span, that's almost $200,000. What happens if that money is allocated to folks in their seats during school? Or what happens if, if that money is donated to or dedicated to folks when they're in utero, like Jeffrey Canada figured out in the Harlem Children's Zone, taking 97 blocks of the poorest census tract area and transforming the education outcomes, putting them on pace to exceed those from the wealthiest zip codes in the entire state of New York. So there are novel ideas out there there are opportunities being taken to 
triune. All right, so we have this poll ending, um, and then we're gonna launch our second poll. And this is the evaluative poll. And I do wanna thank Nick Charles. He hung in there for a long time, uh, waiting to speak, and Plachette Monroe, who helped to uh, get Nick on here as well. Plachette is the advisory board chairperson for the Financial Empowerment Center at Prince George's Community College. We've been doing daily programming since the beginning of COVID. And like I said at the start, we have gone over 100 programs serving over 1,000 people. That means every day for the last, I don't know how many days, 120 days or so, uh, just about excluding Sundays, uh, we've done programming and attracted audiences and helped them with their outcomes around improving credit, increasing savings, reducing debt, and including investing money on the stock market, learning about real estate investing, learning about the unemployment situation. Unemployment situation in this state uh, Nick, something you might be able to speak to a little better, but as of a month ago, uh, there were folks two months into the the COVID uninsurance, uh, unemployment insurance that had not gotten paid and they had put in for it uh, in, a, in March. So we don't know on the ground level what the delays are or why they are that way. It could be capacity, it could be infrastructure, technology, it could be some other things, but um, you know, can you can you speak to that briefly about the unemployment pandemic insurance and PPP in brief? Yeah, it's been a it's been a major problem. You know, uh, the Democratic Caucus we had to come together and uh, put out a message because the lack of transparency and what the governor's office was doing in his administration. Uh, I've had at least 150 people reach out to my office. Uh, and I've had to try to help folks across this across the process to get uh, immediate access. But it's 141 legislators in the state of Maryland, and every single one of them were getting about the same amount of folks uh, and pushing that over to that particular department. Uh, and it just became a massive backlog. And all of that stems from uh, the the lack of resources that they had with having the proper amount of people and the system being so old. And then they tried to get a brand new system. Because at one point in time, you could not get unemployment if you were a 1099 employee. So they had to create a whole new system for that. Um, but I still have people right now. Uh, I get an email every day letting me know out of those 150 plus people where they are in the process as far as getting their unemployment benefits. So we still have people right now in June who have not received their unemployment benefits, still to this day. Wow. So a, a lot of this, what I, what I will ask everyone is we need to scream, we need to shout, and we need to let this governor know how we feel about his administration and what they're doing or lack of doing allowing folks to get this money to be able to survive. You know, I try to leave people with some type of uh, feeling where at least let them know that right now in the state of Maryland, and especially in Prince George's County, we're not allowing for any evictions to take place. So for folks who are not receiving their money, you will not be able to be put out of your house. Uh, no foreclosures or evictions being put out your apartment complex. Uh, Pepco cannot shut off your electricity right now. Uh, in addition to Pepco not being able to shut off your electricity, the cell phone companies cannot cut off your cell phone and kill your communication ability. They cannot cut off your internet in your house so you can have access to internet. And there are multiple programs across the county and the state where they are offering free food packages for families at this time. So with all of these problems that we have, uh, I'm, I'm happy to know that we have some of the structural things in place to help folks in this desperate time of need. But that doesn't stop the fact that we need to keep our foot on the necks and on the gas of the governor's administration and making sure we hold him, him accountable and his administration accountable for making sure the unemployment benefits get out to folks. Folks not having money right now in June is a problem. It is a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on the call. Um, there's so many exciting things going on. Seize the moment. Be a part of the change. 
Um, enjoy your weekend. Get some rest, relaxation. Rebuild yourself up. Find some things you can do, mind, body, and spirit, to keep yourself feeling good about who you are, despite some of the things we have around us. But even in the midst of that chaos, always train your mind to see that silver lining. I'll end you with this. To me, everything we've seen so far has been God orchestrated. How in the world did we have the death of Kobe Bryant, which broke down black men across the world that went right into COVID, that went right into quarantine, that went right into George Floyd, that, that concoction, that gumbo of incidences created this whole dynamic you have now where people were getting restless. Their spirits were injured. They mostly weren't in good, good space, which promoted them to lash out against the people, against the system. With that being said, though, we have to pace ourselves and be marathon runners, not sprinters. I wish you well. I thank you again for being on board. I thank Angela, Marshall, Heath, the entire team. Thank you so much. You guys enjoy your weekend. My name is Brian Hamlin. Sometimes I go by Brian Heath. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. You guys have a blessed day. Yeah. Imagine living like a black man. Yeah. Uh. Imagine living like a black man. Yo. A black man in America. Sort of kind of like being treated just like a terrorist. Living how I'm living, it's really no comparisons. They systematically trying to kill us, now that's the scariest. I swear the numbers getting various, I'm feeling like I'm Harriet. An underground soldier for my people that I'm carrying. They killed George Floyd, now I'm trying to fill the void. This the life my brother's living, it's really hard Yo, to avoid. I keep my hoodie on for Trayvon, I do it for my day ones. Sandra Bland spoke about the path that we should stay on. I can't breathe through this nonsense. The kill coming constant the crooked politicians is never willing to stop this yeah, Breonna Taylor say her name say it again Breonna Taylor say her name until we win I pray to God daily deliver me from my sin trying to start a revolution and here is where we begin yeah if you want some change you gotta model it what else yeah speak about your feelings never bottle it let's talk about yeah. it try to do it peaceful shout the Kaepernick I really hate the fact that black lives not mattering it's time to shift the narrative I'm switching up the pattern yeah it's a pandemic and racial wars that I'm battling yeah. saddened by the hate and discrimination it's real they gave us freedom under control knowledge man what's the deal man who's created equal I'm trying to find the equation uh, founded on oppression we live in this situation Situation. Uh, new days coming, I know that my people waiting Swear we praying for a change and my brothers is losing patience uh, Yeah, so I gotta live for Oscar Grant And I gotta live for Eric Garner Yeah, And I gotta live for Terrence Crutcher yeah. Swear I gotta live for Michael Brown Yeah, man I gotta live for Freddie Gray Yeah, uh, And I gotta live for Betty Jones Yeah, yeah Swear I gotta live for Nipsey Hustle. Yeah. Swear to God that I'ma grind and put my people on.